This is LS, and you're on Thorin's YouTube channel, so cut the Western shit. Right, this is going to be episode 26 of Elitist United. We're not going to go with veteran suggestion and make it like season two, episode one. Because, <laughs> I mean, to be fair, like, would have been a pretty big fucking cliffhanger considering we were all saying G2 was going to win Worlds in the uh, in the one before Worlds. So I guess it was, <laughs> would even work in that sense, you know? Like, oh, what happened in the meantime? And then we just tell you 20 minutes into the episode, as American TV is known to do. So anyway, we're going to keep going with the normal numbering sequence, mainly because, and I can't lie, one of the main reasons I like to just keep going by numbers is because I want to see which of my shows can actually beat the other shows and even though just making more episodes doesn't mean you win the dive just sit you know just saying but anyway just making more shows you know but at the same time it's fun to see what can get to 100 what can get to 69 and then oh, oh everyone in esports can make a hilarious joke before that because they're not all just cliched fucking hacks who have like four jokes and four of them are off 4chan so anyway let's start with this episode veteran we're back we're back it's all good it's all good so veterans here you might have seen him doing the eu masters final that's about all you'll see him doing. He'll be on this show, and that's where he'll stay. <laughs> so that's actually one of the secrets to working with me, veteran, is when you initially work with me, you're like, oh, this is cool. I get a little sort of boost to popularity, a little bit fair. And then everyone's like, you're associated with that Thorin guy. Fuck you. You never work in this industry. And then you're like, but Thorin, now I can't work anywhere. And I'm like, welcome to my web. I can go anywhere. <laughs> and you are stuck on the web. So <laughs> see, well, I'll, be then, I, I'll be back streaming in January. Oh, there we go. No one, no one can ban me off that for associating with you. So we'll there all we be go. good. There we go. Oh, you never know. They could try. So, okay, yeah. our guests for this episode is, right, first of all, oh, I didn't actually notice, I didn't actually notice he'd shaved there. Oh, it's a, just kidding. It's obviously a photo. In the bottom left-hand corner, we've got Cabra Maravilla. The only time I'm ever going to say that, from now on, we refer to him as Cabra only. That's just a stupid name. I'm sorry. Like, if you don't speak Spanish, it's just a rubbish name. So, what we're going to do is... He works for, like, what do you do at the moment currently? Are you still a caster? Uh, no, I used to work for LVP until the end of the year, but then I quit the job. So I'm basically doing nothing right now. Like, have you got any info? Is there a reason you left? Yeah, it was uh, really stressing and I needed some time for myself. Right. I can just imagine Thorin sat there thinking, you know nothing of stress in content creation. Whatever. It's, it's all fine. Look, 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 walls off my back. Like no, but Thorin has there. different rule sets for himself and others. For of example, course. He was earlier flaming the shitty jokes, but he's doing the Shershi meme again. Shame on <laughs> you, Thorin. This is wasted as fuck. Right, so you're telling me <laughs> that if I was to bring Shikaras on my show, I would make some sort of whack expected. I'd never do something like that. I hope you understand that, Cabra. I have a level of class and dignity that supersedes you and your shit late game team that was terrible. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that thing he used to do, that league that he used to do, that's so prestigious. You know what, veteran? You were always bigging up the National Leagues. You were telling me National Leagues are brilliant. They're a way to get like your talent out there. Sure, let's admit, if you play for some of the really small ones at like the UK, well, maybe you won't get seen. But if you play for the big ones, we're talking the Ultra Liga, specifically LVP is the big one. If you were to say win LVP, fuck it. If you were the MVP of the LVP, LVP finals, <laughs> literally the MVP. Like you carried that motherfucker. You were, it literally you snatched victory from the jaws of death. Almost certainly you'd be picked up. You'd have fucking offers come in. NA'd be knocked. Oh hey Freeze. Hey, I did, <laughs> didn't see you down there, mate. What's? Are you doing? Are you doing? Well, you know, I just won my second M uh, MVP this uh, this week. All oh, right. I'm sorry, I, did, I don't keep up with the LVP. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's Cup. good. You know. <laughs> oh, there we go. Iberian the boy Cup won shit. it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but along those lines, okay. So Freeze is obviously formerly was a long time LEC player when it was EU LCS, and then more recently he did a stint in Turkey. Then he came to the LVP where he was before playing with Splice when he won the the match I was alluding to before. That obviously wasn't just a general comment. And then now you played with Mad Lions Academy team in the Iberic Cup or whatever, for, uh, which is yeah. like the Spanish Cup or whatever. I've got one question for you, and you know how I do my shows, Freeze. So we're just coming straight off the bat. Why the fuck are you playing for the Mad Lions Academy team? Why are you playing for Mad Lions? I don't know, dude. It's just uh, they're better AD carries, I guess, than me. I mean... <laughs> Do you have a I gun at the side of your fucking no. screen <laughs> making you no, say that? Like, 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 honestly, Cars is really good. Uh, sure. If if anyone, if I would ever get replaced by anyone, I would uh, be fine being replaced by Carsey. Okay. Um uh, the coaching staff even said that if Carsey wouldn't join Mad Lions, I would be the main AD over someone like, 
you know, comp, for example. I mean, I will just say them saying that after they have signed him means absolutely fuck all. Like, yeah, you know. I mean, it's like, <laughs> that's it's like, like me like telling a, my side bitch, like, I'd probably yeah. marry you if I wasn't with the other girl, but, you know, pretty I'll much, never leave her, of course, so, yeah. but, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like, uh, yeah, I don't know, yeah. It's just, it's weird, dude. It's, um, I think I have to win the EU Masters to even, like, be considered good, I guess, at this point. Uh, four years of LAC experience aren't old enough, you know, like, uh, I'm old. I can improve. That's what I keep hearing from teams, you know, like it, it's literally the same. Like they are afraid to tell me that I'm fucking bad. They just, they just hide behind the thing that they say, oh, first, you know, he's an old player. We don't want him. He can not improve instead of just straight up telling me to my face, dude, you're fucking shit. We're taking this young guy because he has more talent. Okay. Like If they would say that, I would be like, all right. Good. No, sure right but just like at least don't hide behind saying that i'm fucking old that's just that's just stupid as fuck like you know just... i will say like i feel as though one angle this is actually something obviously i'd like to open up to the other guys as well we can get in on this one angle i feel to the freeze thing is if i look at who was recruited to lec and then i look at who wasn't the problem I feel like he has is, listen, if this was NA, you'd get a starting spot. Like, you have a famous name, blah, 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 all the rest of it. Like, they love that shit. In LEC at the moment, it feels like they only have the legit good players, and then they just want to gamble on a new prospect because they want to gamble. They want to gamble that that guy gets yep. two times better and gets way better. So the logic with you is, like, they might, again, if they don't think you're a monster right now, they're thinking, like, you know, then there's no, like, what's the upside? Like, how much better is he going to get? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, <coughs> right now I feel like the business model for EULCS teams, they're, they realize that they're losing a lot of money, paying yeah. uh, a lot of money. Uh, like the ever since franchise came out, uh, the salaries went to like a heavy, sure. just like doubled, tripled. And now again, it's going down because the last two years, people realize that it's just not sustainable business to pay the players so much. So right now, everyone's in uh, the sort of like a crisis mode where they want to sign the next Reckless, when they want to sign the next Forgiven, and then sell him for a lot, you know? Uh, and that's how I feel like everyone's hyped up about the rookies. Everyone feels that they will double, triple their price that they have right now in a few years, and that they will sell them later. And they don't really care about losing in LAC because, hey, there's no relegation, so who the fuck cares if you were last or six, you know? It's, it's just like... For the teams that are not top three, no one fucking... Like, literally, the top four, top five teams care about winning, but literally, the last five teams that are last in the LAC, they don't, they don't care about at all. At all about to, to be honest, winning. though, like, even the teams who are top teams actually have an incentive to do what you just said. <laughs> yeah. Like, a perfect example, I know he's not a newer player, but let's imagine Kobe had been a rookie last year. Then Splice would have been laughing, because what they did was use him, qualify for Worlds, and then just sell him to some dumbass American org who's like, oh my god, these players are so much better than Mash Me or what, and then just sign to that, you know, like, <laughs> that's not even... Yeah. You, you get the benefit of getting him being a good player, and then you sell him. Like, it's not even a bad business model. Oh, Splice, here's a million. Let's go. Woo! <laughs> you know, just for selling him for so long. So I much, think a, yeah. a big factor as well, or at least I get the feeling that people mostly watch European Masters when they want to scout EU, but maybe yeah. National League isn't watched as hard. Because uh, when I watch, w was watching Freeze, especially during the summer, uh, I thought that he brought a lot into the wave management of bottling, and he was overall, in my opinion, the best ADC in the, comp in the competition. I know that's not very popular in Spain because they didn't win summer, but I think he, he played really, really well. But the problem is that uh, since he didn't play in European, the next day from from the finals, that the first day of Super League, <coughs> uh, everyone was asking me why did the hell did Freeze win MVP if he was playing so so bad the first few weeks of summer because he right. was played out, he uh, tried harder a lot and he needed a rest, but he was actually a very good IDC throughout the whole year, but never performed really well in EU Masters. Yeah, I mean, bot lane difference is actually what qualified uh, Splice to that EU Masters in total, actually. Like, yeah. it, the discrepancy between them and every other uh, Spanish bot lane was absolutely insane. Uh, and then what happened at EU Masters and why they weren't able to win it is because everything switched towards solo lane focused and your team was not very yep. good at playing around its solo laners versus a team like Mad Lions that, that are not very smart. They are actually very good at dogmatically playing towards top side. So when, when the power was on freeze, he, he would be able to carry them to win the entire uh, split as you should expect someone of Freeze's caliber to be able to do. Um, but the game shifted into a region where he wasn't then able to win EU Masters. And because of that meta dependency, if you don't qualify for EU Masters at all, it's very difficult to ascertain how good you are or not. And 
if you don't win the whole thing, it's very difficult for you to pass an eye test versus like the people yep. who are in charge of making decisions, which aren't coaches or analysts. They're actually managers, owners, GMs, all this now. So I mean, I've been in esports for eight years, right? And I'm still waiting for sort of like a, a teams to have a scouting agents. Like for fuck's sake, every sport has a scouting agent. It just literally goes to every high school. Uh, you know, like if you play football yeah. in America, literally everyone is like a single scouting agent has a single school and he just makes a report on all these players right and then you just have a actually someone that understands what he's doing but in in lac it just feels like no one cares about anything else than top four in eu masters like no one yeah. even watches anything and then when yeah. top four when like semifinals happen in eu masters that's where everyone starts watching and because they're like People are lazy in esports. They're super <coughs> lazy to do their due diligence about players. They will watch one or two games and they will think this guy is either fucking bad or this guy is faker. And that's how it has been for a while. And it's how it is most likely going to be for a while. So I don't see it anytime changing. Uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm not saying I'm 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 good, right? Uh, like I don't think so. Like I'm a, like a. I should 100% be in LAC. <coughs> But I feel like I should at least be considered or get a, a chance, you know, to prove myself. Skill-wise, sure. you should. I yeah. just think that the big issue is that there are two things that are a barrier to entry for you, even if it was generally accepted that you were skilled enough. Um, number one, most of the GM's owners, etc., are not the kind of people who are going to recognize that you, are genu- uh, that you are genuinely skilled enough. And number two, the business model that you have just ascertained in franchising is still the best. These guys want to be able to sell a player in two to three years' time, and you are right now 25, so we're talking 27, 28, they're going to want to sell you, and they know that even if you have looks like Faker for a year or two, uh, it's going to be very difficult to sell you at a high price, whereas if Kazi pops off and Foreign's going to really love how Kazi pops off much more. He's probably going to hate comp by the end of the split. Um, yep. then I mean, you'll be in, sell them yeah, off the slope. skill difference is huge between those two, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, and and comp, comp's more in like the reckless camp. Kazi yeah. is much more in like the forgiven aggression camp. So, and I, yeah, I could see them wanting to sell him off in two to three years' time if yep, franchising sure. is profitable for Mad Lions. They want to bail out. Well, now you sell your rookie players that you've brought up that have now made big names for themselves to a North American team that will pay him two point two million or some shit like this. You know, like yep. yeah, that, that's a fascinating business model. That's fantastic for them, and ultimately, it doesn't matter how good you are, Freeds, because you can't fit into that you know i mean if i would be like top three then for sure i would get an offer from lac even if i would uh you know like mm. play for two three years and i wouldn't get be sell, sold but i'm not right i'm like i, I think yeah. my, of myself like top eight top seven right now like i for sure i'm better than the bottom 80 80 carries yeah in LAC, but i'm not like good enough to just like not uh take that business model away from them you know so you need to be good enough to, for them to be confident enough that you can full carry a team of four rookies that they can sell in two to three years' time, right? That you can yep. add value to them in the two to three years that you're there. And unless you just straight win EU Masters in a super dominant fashion, full on MVP, with all the other accolades that you've had, it's not going to matter. Like, no one talks about RNG. They won every single yep. tournament and then lost the finals of what, well, not finals it was, but they lost at the World Championships. So no one fucking talks about them. Equally, no one talks about your achievements in the Spanish League just because he didn't win EU Masters, you know? Yeah, sure. I mean, there, like Peter Dan said something that I agree on, but like sup- completely with it. He said that even like, uh, even if I'm equally good as the rookies, I will never be taken all yeah. in the, in yeah. LAC uh, as long as I'm not like double the skill of the rookies. Yeah. He's right. Yeah. Sure. And yeah. the other angle as well is like, like the most frustrating one to me is, at least in Europe, as I said, a lot of the players getting a chance instead are rookie players where people you know, hope there's a big upside to them and they get a lot better. And I can see for the team why they do that. The one that's a killer is if you're just looking from the outside and you don't know anything about the business, mate, you are better than a whole bunch of the AD carries that are going to start in the fucking LCS. But the problem is... It's hard to flame the LCS for not scouting when Europe itself is barely fucking scouting. Uh, and in this scenario, like we say, they only look at EU Masters anyway. So yes. mm. I sort of get why the LCS one also probably didn't happen. Mm. True. Right, anyway, so, like, should we jump into some teams? 
<coughs> how about we do your team first then, since maybe you can give us some insights. Since a lot of the players, obviously, in your right. team, the LCS version of it, Mad Lions, right? This is the team where I think it, I think it was Kelsey who said this. Where basically, if you're a fan from the outside, you're actually going to think this is like a Golden Guardians project. Like, oh look, they've just got all these cheap players I've never heard of who are only playing at national league level. And actually, like, if you look at what they've done, haven't they basically made like a fucking super team of players that yes. were at the national league level? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. No, yeah. Th- yeah, this is like I mean, the kind of team I wouldn't I would call think. it a super team, though. But like, who are the players? Just name them off in case people don't know. Right, it's, uh, it's supposed to be Oromel on top lane. I used to play yes. with him for one year. Uh, yep. Great guy, really nice guy. Uh, jungler should be Shadow. Uh, sure. Mid laner is. He's from Mouse Spots for people who don't. Humanoid is the yep. mid laner, right? Yeah, he's staying. That is the only one play, The only player. Because remember, for people who don't remember, this is the team obviously rebranded from Splice, just yep. in case people are yep. confused. Anyway, sure. yeah, what was the bot lane? Uh, Bot lane should be uh, Karzy and Gistic. Right, that's there the rumor. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and I mean, Gistic uh, also from Mouse Spots. People who don't know, and then Karzy was from Big, who actually was the team that veteran. Obviously, was watching win the EU Masters. So in yeah, theory, the best team in in National League level, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you think of them, though, Freeze? Uh, I have to say first that I don't, I honestly think that Spring EU Masters were much higher skill than EU in summer. I sort of I mean, it makes like sense it. with all the players that went to LC- yep. LEC. Everyone right? literally went to LEC. So, like, Rogue took uh, uh, the whole team. Misfits took the whole team, right? So, the skill dropped a lot in, in summer. Uh, but overall, I think that there were really good players. I'm kind of scared for uh, Humanoid Mark in the team, though, because <coughs> when I've talked to him, and he sort of, like, expects now to get to Worlds every single year, right? And his team just literally dropped the whole roster. They signed four rookies, and if he's gonna expect that he's gonna get the worlds with four rookies, you know, it just might be tough for them. And for me, I, my eyes are on Gistic and Shadow in that roster because literally, if those two players will perform well, the whole team will perform well. Yep. If those two teams, uh, those two players won't perform well, I'm slightly afraid the, the team's gonna fall apart straight up. So uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure on those two, for sure. My like, well, the, that are in. By the way, oh. just one note is one problem when we were discussing these teams. I ran into this when I was doing the Listen Local NA episode, is because like not even like not 100% of the roster moves are even guaranteed, it's hard to actually do what people want you to do before a season, which is like, would this be a top five, top three team? Yeah. You know, do that thing, because who the fuck knows it? We don't know yeah. some of the teams entirely, and some of them are brand new, so... If you can, if you know, if you have a sense in that regard, you can make it vague if you want. Like you don't have to be too specific. But as we go on in the episode, maybe people can say that because that's the thing. If these are all the super rookies, veteran, should this be a team that could be a world's team? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I always say this, but I definitely here I have to remind people that it's it's far from unheard of for Europe to send rookie teams. In fact, every year but last year, and last year we didn't ever have any full rookie teams qualify until Rogue collapsed and Misfits collapsed in the middle of summer, right? Um, until then, we, we still sent Humanoid. He's a rookie. But, yeah, we still sent Humanoid, but we didn't send like a majority rookie team sure. every single year um, before then. Uh, so it wouldn't surprise me if this was the team that did it, though. This this team is brilliantly well put together. Together. My only worry about it is how Gistic and Kazi will work together in lane, because Gistic is Gistic is much more of like a disengaged support player. Um, in fact, they ended up pairing him uh, with Konjo in, in lanes like Swain Tarek and stuff like this. The question is whether that is because of Gistic's flaws or Konjo's flaws. I lean more towards it being down to Konjo's flaws. Konjo got very overrated, but I like to say that he was an illusion created by Shadow and Gistic. Um, I think with uh, Kazi, you'll see a return to him picking stuff like Shen, these heavy engaged champions that he was known for before that iteration of Mouse Sports. And if so, we have an incredibly aggressive bot lane. We have a very strong mid laner. This guy was like a top three mid lane last split. Um, and honestly, Arome was like, has has been the next big thing for top lane for a long yeah. time. Like, I mean, I for sure, heard. if, if uh, they want to play aggressive mid and bot, Arome is a very good weak side player. Yeah. So they, 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 need him. they need him. Well, 
There's sure. that, and you also have Shadow, who is very able to play around the priorities that these lanes are going to give him. He is the most intelligent jungler coming out of the amateur scene by far. Um, he has none of the flaws or the other ones, so he already basically plays like an LEC level uh, jungler. There aren't a lot of issues that he needs to iron out to get to that point. He just needs to get more consistent in this regard. Um, but he's yeah. the one that I would, yeah, he's the one that I would have most hope for. And him and Gistic already have very good pre-existing synergy once the map breaks open. Uh, so I have very high hopes for this team. Uh, I, I don't think Humanoid shouldn't expect to go to Worlds. He should be fighting for that right up until the very end. Uh, right, so. veteran, at the risk of triggering you, mate, I'm going to ask a Here question that could be dangerous. Hit me. Their coaching staff, coaching staff of Splice. Now, you weren't really a fan of the way Splice played, <laughs> even the way some of the coaches thought about the team and the way that they would model their squad. So with a whole bunch of new rookies... Does that make up for it? Do they get to mold these guys? Is that a fucking nightmare scenario? I don't know. You tell me. If they you play the same way again, no one has... No, oh, one no has exactly. <laughs> they will not. If it's they the same not. one three years... and Yeah, they, this, te- this roster shouldn't from the off. So if they do, we just blame the coaching staff for the last three um, years of Slice I'm play. But, pretty sure the players, uh, like Carson, both a Carson and Humanoid will force, even if yes. the coaching staff would want to play the way uh, they played before... Karzi and Humanoid are players that would hard force the coaching staff to not yeah, play that way. Like they, they, you know, when they say something, they like a uh, stamp on it, and it's just like this has to happen, sort of, you know, like. And they're very good friends, both of them together. So they will have a lot of say in the team how the team was gonna play. And since they are both aggressive, I would expect them to play pretty aggressive. Well, they would. Yeah. I think personality-wise, Arome will probably end up being a dominant personality there. So he might end up being like the whippo of that team in terms of whoever changes his mind kind of wins the argument, right? Um, yep. But I do ultimately yep. think that it, this will be much more under the player's control. Uh, well, here's I, the thing, though, Veteran. This is also yeah. going to test us, mate, because we can't talk up humanoid. Like, I've been saying he should be in Fnatic over Nemesis. Now, listen, I actually believe that, but like 10% yeah. was just to fuck with Nemesis. I'm not lying. But so, <laughs> I'll just make it transparent. I keep, with it, I keep it real. I think it's fucking an idiot anyway. So here's the thing. Now that Humanoid is in this team with the theory of a bunch of whole very competent players, this should be his split to go fucking ham. Uh, this yep. should be his season. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say we should predict them to be top three in the first split. Though if they are, Worlds is an absolute guarantee. Um, yep. But traditionally, how these teams have gone has been that the first split has brought them into mid-tier, and then the second split has been the one where they've pushed forward into top tier because they've been more consistent now, right? Yep. Like, they should experiment in this split. They should try to push the boundaries, not just play as comfortable as they can play. Uh, they should try to put themselves in uncomfortable situations and learn how to be a good, well-rounded team because they have the potential to go all the way in Summer Split. Maybe not necessarily win the whole of, of Summer Split, but they have the potential to go all the way to Worlds, which they won't do if they just do what Vitality did, which was play the way that they played in Challenger Series or in Amateur Scene, I guess now we don't call it Challenger Series anymore, uh, and then wonder why everyone just figured out the one way that they can play in Summer, you know? Yeah. Uh, they, they, they shouldn't feel too bad if they only become a mid-tier team in Spring, uh, but in Summer, yeah. they should I'd be I'd expect them team. to be top 6 in Spring and then Top four, top top four in in summer. That's what I would yeah. expect them to. But like we have to rem- remember that uh, Mad Lions uh, are one of those teams that completely changed everything, and they will be competing versus teams that didn't change much, right? Yeah. So in spring split, it's going to be pretty hard for them. I think. I mean, you say that, but well, most of the teams in LEC were shit. Oh, come on, yeah, come on. Since you played with the with the Rome freeze, what do you think of a meta game where he has to play from top? Because I understand that he's really good at flanking champions and overall playing weak side, but I'm not so sure that he's able to to play for the the pressure as well. I in, like a winning match where you're supposed to to side pressure later. Do you think this is because your teams were not adapted to this style, or is this a preference of the player? I think it's both. I think it's preference of the player as well. I think, uh, or one of our best weakness might be him not pushing the limits enough. On, on he has a certain champion pool that he plays, and those champions he plays super well. Like you know, Oren, Vladimir, Choga, he plays those so well. Like he completely mastered those champions. He knows how to play them. But then uh, on like a hard carry champions, he doesn't push the limits enough. So I feel like. It was it was for us both of the teams not playing towards top and him as well. But I truly believe in Orama in his potential to learn. He's one of the for me he was one of the players that was uh, learning the fastest and I've ever played with. 
uh, together with Broken Blade. So those two for sure are, I, I think he can learn to play aggressive. Oh, I think he's super talented. If anyone yeah. is looking to watch uh, like a maybe quote unquote SOAS type player that has yes. brilliant engages, yeah. I think it's yeah, so he is, fucking yep. good at engaging and flanking. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's demented. Yeah. I would really yeah. recommend watching this player for that kind of play. Okay, and give us your general thoughts on the team, though, Cabra. I mean, I'm not that informed about the other rookies. I know okay. Karsi from playing in Kiev. I think he's really, mm -hmm. really super talented player. So I have pretty high hopes up for this team. But I think I need to see a bit more of uh, Shadow. I haven't seen a lot, and I want to see it work with Humanity because I think Chelsea was was actually uh, not. No, not boosting Humanity because Humanity is really good, but he gave a really good structure to mid lane to, uh, so that Humanity could play comfortably. So I need to see yep. the synergy and maybe the top side meta game, but I think it's definitely a really good team. Yeah, uh, like, okay, uh, yeah, in Madlands, I'll just say in Madlands, Zerks and which actually were the brain of the team. Oh, I mean, in Splice, in, in Splice LAC team, uh, and that's that's what I would say, right? So, yeah. Sure. Makes okay. sense. So, so two things then. Um, one, I'd make that <laughs> Kif because uh, that old Kif roster was like the old, old, old Mouse Sports roster of its time. Uh, Mouse Sports used to have a roster where it was going to be Alfari top, it didn't end up being Alfari, it ended up being Warding top. But the rest of the team was, it was uh, Max Floor, uh, Caps, Upset, and North Skeren. They had this team at one point uh, when they were all like 15 years old. Um, and obviously that team ended up being um, like, well, they ended up having like three of the most insane players uh, that you could have, that, that were going to end up being in the LEC at some point. That Kif roster had Arome, had Aesthetic, um, but it also had Zazi, uh, Kazi, and Labrov. So that 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 team had Whoever a bunch of Whoever is insane. doing scouting for that team is yes. fucking good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, I don't know who's doing it, but... Origin. Freeze, yeah. it's Chavis from Origin BC, and he's actually really competent. Really? really, you know the That's crazy it. thing about that. I mean, we've had this discussion a million times on this show, and definitely on Listen Local, because they are because this is the thing that NA idiots love to do is they go, "Oh, our league sucks. What should we do?" And then they just say the same things they always did, like, "Ah, oh, because get an even better Korean." And what I told them every time was, <laughs> "Get scouts in Europe." Like by the sounds of it, this guy should be hired immediately by some like Team Liquid yep. TSM oh, type. Yeah, of sorry, but who will scout the scouts? This is a big dilemma. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, you're right. Exactly. <laughs> who what, who watches the watch? Yeah, yeah, no one's confident <laughs> enough. Wait, that, that Origin roster, by the way, the Origin BCN roster, nobody expected it to okay. go anywhere near yeah. as far as it did. But they're like, not so, even... so good together, right? Yeah. Like, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, individually, they're not that great, right? But just like together, they're yeah. so good. Like, I, I don't actually, know who I would love to see a bit more of Thanthara. I think he, he's pretty good. Thing is, though, you are right, though, Cabra. Like, what really should happen is this veteran. That's how we fix this thing. We take our own self-interest. We sell ourselves as the people who recommend you the scouts. We're like agents yeah. that have a finder's fee. We just bring you the scout, then he brings you the players. Like, because I can't get you all the players. I could probably get you someone who could get them, though. True, know? true. Not a bad but, idea. Yeah. I would recommend that Origin guy if anyone wants to scout and you can't afford me. Uh, I would recommend that Origin guy. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is that, um, do you mind if I shit on, ah, fuck, I'm the co-host. Um, if Tear Wolf was my jungler, you could not pay me to take any risks either. So I don't Why would I care player. if you shit on a player? Like, have you I ever seen my career? Oh, jungle. fair enough. Right, I see you. I see you. Right, it was, I, was good. I thought it was a win. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, Tear Wolf, Tear Wolf was ungodly bad. Like, I have no idea why this guy was ever in Spanish League and Freeze deserves 50 MVPs for being able to get this guy any trophies out <laughs> um, And <laughs> it, it, the, the, the biggest issue with Tear Wolf is that he just cannot play around topside at all. He doesn't seem to understand any scenario where he should have been topside whatsoever. It was like the worst aspects of Broxer on crack with none of the good aspects of Broxer because he's mechanically terrible as well. Like, this guy could only play Zack and shit. Um, but Aroma before that, when he was on Kif, was a very strong Fiora player, for example. Oh. He was a good Irelia player. He has actually got a history on strong split-pushing champions, so I'm not actually worried about a scenario where they have to play strong side towards top, even though he has had the biggest trial by fire ever of having to play weak side, which is playing on that splice roster. Obviously, you can do that. No one will ever question that he can't do that, but, um, but he can play strong side as well. I'm very confident that he'll be able to adapt to that. Yep. I agree. Okay. 
Right, let's skip to another team. Actually, I'll, well, I, I like it on these episodes sometimes if we just pick out the ones that are fun and we can talk about those ones, then we'll figure yeah. out the ones that are left over. So, like, how about this? It's not an all-new roster, but in light of the fact we've referenced Broxa, obviously Southmade has literally replaced Broxa in Fnatic, and then the other thing is they added Mithy as a coach. Now, there's two sides to that, right? Before you know they're getting Southmade, I mean, I know roughly where you're going here, veteran, but we'll ask anyway. Was Broxa part of the problem with last year's Fnatic? Would he have been a piece you would have considered? I know, like, it's like, fuck it, like, just like, you may as well just do like, your old skit, like, yeah, right, start at the top. Yeah, yeah, there you go. The, what Broxa, do you think? Broxa was the limiting factor on that team, and Team Liquid are going to start missing X Smithy at a point for sure. Uh, Broxa was was the, the the biggest issue that they had to that they had to work around. Nemesis had to become such a vocal player as he is, in spite of the fact that he had such an unvocal jungler. Having an unvocal mid jungle duo can be death, and it was death for their first eight games. And Nemesis should be given credit for adapting to that because we've often talked about how that would normally take a personality transplant to turn a, a mute into a very vocal talkative player. But Nemesis did that. He did that to make up for a flaw on Broxa. Broxa never had to make up for that issue. Their dogmatic play style, where they either played purely for top or purely for bot, which revealed Hillisang to be one of the most insane supports in the history of man. Um, that dogmatic play style was because Boxer didn't have the fidelity to fix waves before he played around a certain side of the map. He didn't understand these high-level concepts, and he never had to understand them because they had a really strong system, which is a trigger word for Fnatic fans, uh, that worked around it brilliantly. Um, now, with self-made, they, they, they no longer have that limiting factor they can play a wider variety of styles a much wider variety of styles and there there's now no like hard limit on this team and also commiseration to young for taking a team that has such hard limits to game five versus g2 twice you know that's still absolutely insane um that team should not have gotten that far. and top it worlds <laughs> yeah yeah the, the the kind of player that you would need to not be a limiting factor is the kind of player team liquid just replaced with broxer so hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's Was a it, lot of rumors yeah, about Fnatic. That's for sure. Uh, oh. Yeah, they had. I heard, they, they, had, I heard they had a lot of attitude problems. Uh, attitude problems that you know, like, got to the point where there's no train going over them. Uh, Let's and... just say it. Sometimes Wonder Boys aren't that wonderful after all. Oofed. No. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so doesn't want to get in on that. He tried that one time. Dude, didn't I work out well for him. Before. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Sorry. Let's get past that. <laughs> I, I, I just want to let every Fnatic fan know that if they think that it is as simple as maybe we shouldn't keep this player, maybe we shouldn't keep this player. No, 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 no. There were so many iterations of the Fnatic roster where like four of them were gone, you know, and only one of them remained. Like there are so many players on there that you could, that, that are potentially the issue. Right, like yeah. it's it seems like a massive train wreck in there of sorts, and I'm amazed they ended up with the roster that they did, um, because I didn't think that there were players there that would agree to play with each other again. So it does bit... adding self made though, who obviously like in terms of like potential and even some of the talent he was able to show in SK, I think a lot of people will had a big upside for him. Does adding him if if Broxa was the limiting factor, yeah, is this now a team that can win LEC, can do everything? Yep. Yeah. So if they if they are able to push through personality clashes, yes, then this is the team that could win the LEC, right? They because have much they have better a, potential, yeah. Yeah. They have a phenomenally intelligent strategical coach. They don't have someone like Young Buck though, who is yes. very strong on aspects yeah. like language uh, that you um, need to yeah, be very I'm, careful about. I'm pretty sure Young Buck was uh, basically the glue that holded the team together yeah. and made them actually compete versus G2. Because I have like the things I've heard, I have no idea how they even played that well uh, yeah. versus uh, G2. Like the stuff that was happening behind the scenes is just crazy. So I'm pretty sure that Youngbug was the guy that was holding the team together. And now the team has so much more potential, uh, obviously, but way more risk as well. So it's double edged sword again, I think. I personally love this change, not only because uh, I think uh, self made Lang is a better jungler than Broxa, because, but also because I got the feeling that maybe Weepo was calling for a, a lot of Broxa's movements towards topside, and he oftentimes would uh, reach top when the wave is bouncing improperly and there is neither mm -hmm. a gank nor a dive, or the enemy top laner is backing. My feeling is that the jungler will not do this by himself. I think he's getting shot calling 
should go yeah. around. But the yeah. thing with Selfmade is that they actually they won everything in Spain in two uh, in twenty eighteen, playing with Werlip in the top lane instead of <laughs> there you yeah, go yeah Werlip instead of Wipo. But the thing is the team. The self made man did even more than Broxa going top lane. He ganked for every matchup and often got really good results because he's super talented, but then didn't affect the game because the game had nothing to do with topside. So I think he will be a brilliant match for Wipo. He can read his calls much better, I think, than, than Broxa could. And seeing him away again with Nemesis, I think, will be fantastic to enable him instead of the like weaker mid lane situation he had this year. So is the way. a perfect storm of game <coughs> and decisiveness. That's yep. the thing. Like there are plenty of people who understand the theory but aren't like exceptional at the game because they aren't completely decisive in game about what they need to do. But the self made makes those decisions in a snap mm -hmm. second and they're yeah, always the optimal really, ones. Really good. Yeah. yeah, he's an instinctual player as well. Uh yes. self -made. and he's yeah. very good at it. Now nah, let's just put it that way. Yeah. By the way, I like on what on Listen Local when we had grabs on to talk about like the EU rosters, etc. He actually reiterated something he said when we had that episode with him and Youngbok on. We were basically bringing oh, yeah. up the Broxa talk it and seeing how, you know, like how would the, his coach do it and how would the rival do it? And what, uh, what was bizarre to me was his opinion is so far from all the analysts I've heard. Because as far as I remember, and listen, I obviously haven't looked this up right now. So if I actually misquote him, I apologize entirely. Take it with a grain of salt. Maybe go look it up. Go look up, listen, local. Go to the part in the episode. But from what I remember, his actual description, like... Basically, my take was very similar to yours when I first heard about the move that they would replace a Smithy with Broxer. Like, people like Loco were loving it. Like, which one of the best junglers? And I was like, dude, you took a guy who fixed everything in your team and dealt with everyone in your team and ate a million sa shit sandwiches yep. and you replaced him with someone who needs direction and where the fuck is he going to get it in this team? And if anything, I think they're just going to, like, collapse in on around him, unfortunately. So I actually thought it was a worse move. Like, it was a downgrade and I think they only did it for hype. Well, here's what's weird. When Grabs was describing it. He literally said it's something along the lines of like, when I look at Roxa, I see a guy who would like, basically he, he said the inverse of what Cabra just said, like like a guy who would understand when he needs to go to a spot on the map, like go to the top. So, and I was just thinking like, it is funny how people can have different perspectives, but I mean, I, I'll just say this. Grabs is an actual outlier there. Like, that's the reason I actually think Fnatic fans are even stupider than before. Because it isn't like it's just me and Veteran have a hate boner against Broxa. Literally every analyst who is not employed by Fnatic or Riot has basically the same opinion on Brox, as far as I can tell. They all think like, he's all right, but you know, he's a bit boosted and you know, he has the right team and the right coach. And you know, like they all, basically most people did not have him high in the pecking order in Fnatic. Yeah, I mean, and also Grabs has been somewhat spoiled in the junglers that he's had because we've actually shared a lot of the same junglers in history and they've all been very vocal players who have been able to make their own decisions themselves. So it's probably difficult for him okay. to imagine a player like Broxer. And it would, would have been difficult for me if I didn't accidentally hire one at one point. Um, and it is such a huge limiting factor. Uh, on so the what you're saying is, like basically, you got the jam jar like 95% of the way off and then Grabs just comes in and... He gets all the credit, like, oh, look, he's popped you straight off. It's fucking so strong, that <laughs> yeah. grabs. And you're like, yeah, was he though? Fucking it should have been me. <laughs> should have been I, me. <laughs> it's, I, I mean, grabs will end up being wrong on that. Like, the way that they... I mean, I actually know a lot now from the off-season of how Fnatic works in-season and a lot of the actual systems that they use. Okay. Um, and the, the, the ways that they worked around it were actually genius. And I think you do a discredit to how good Fnatic were as a five-man unit, as a functional team, uh, if you try to characterize Brox in that way, because he was not that way. Um, but only the way Fnatic ran things could you make a player like that work as well as it I was. I mean, yeah, I have to say, though, like you don't need good players, honestly, in this uh, meta or in this season, right? Like You just need a team that works well together. Like sure. you, you don't you don't need five best players. I mean, if you Mate, look at the team that won players. worlds, they had nowhere near the five best players in the tournament. Even it, it's just hard. like it's just about understanding each other and then just working well together, right? It's just like even if you have uh, one or two players that are not very good, if they do what they that has to be done and yep. they don't bitch about it, then that team was gonna be fucking great. Like Fnatic was the only one competing versus G two, and they had so many issues, but they just got yep. over it and just. They still worked, right? They so. had they had the system to be very, very decisive in the macro plays in the moment. Like it was it was a very kind of traditional sports method of doing things. 
Um, and I thinking about it, more teams that have that don't have like a strong leader, a strong decisive leader in game could do well to learn from what Fnatic did uh, in season to get around these issues. And that just made them work well as a five man. I don't think it can be replicated. I don't think Boxer can just go to Team Liquid and expect them to do it all. Though I wouldn't surprise you, Boxer did well in North America regardless, just because of the caliber of players there and the fact that no one there is really working well as a five man. Thing is, like, like you said earlier, I have a very similar sentiment about Fnatic. Like, I don't look at Fnatic at the end of the year and be like, oh, underwhelmed a bit, though. Didn't do quite as well as they should have done. I'm, I, from the stories I'd heard throughout the year, I'm like, Youngbok is like the best actual real world coach I think I've ever fucking heard of in League of Legends. Like, I've never heard of a Korean guy who could do any of this shit. Like, the, the, basically, he was literally on a fucking, I mean, metaphorically, obviously, he was on a fucking sinking galleon that had tons of holes in it, and he could never plug all the holes, but he would just like plug one and then quickly start working on another one. They do, And then he would just, somehow he kept it afloat and got it in the pot in this analogy. Like, the idea yeah. that they almost beat G2, even in one best of five, and then got top eight at Worlds and in the end the team they lost to being as it was a fucking champion we don't actually even know how good they necessarily were like everyone looked shit when they played against FPX you just got wrecked by them so I actually look at that and I'm like that's why I know we haven't brought this up much but I agree I don't understand what Fnatic was thinking letting that guy walk out the door and even worse I said this on Listen Local I literally to face to face with some of the people in big NA orgs told them before Worlds last year you have got to fucking send this young buck guy a blank check. Like he will, he is the uh, truth. Like this guy is the only one who can do it. Like you can uh, get all the analysts you need. You know. I, what I've heard is that he didn't work with the cer- he didn't want to work again with the certain players on that roster. Right. And he said it will be either me or the player. And the orc chose the player instead of him. Pick the wrong player for that. I'm just going to say that. Like you know, <laughs> so it's like saying me or Bjergsen. TSM's that's probably heard, kicking right? you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No. That's, that's what I've heard. That's what I've heard. Yeah. So, no, here's yeah, the thing though. The other, yep. the other angle to that though is um, that's also where I know we can't do it now just because like the political climate would be terrible. I, in like two years, I would love to do like a feature with Young Buck or like a documentary or something. And what you do is just go through what he did in this year, like what was going yeah. on and give like the real behind the scenes. Because by then it also wouldn't ruin the tactics of the yep. team or ruin the player. Like I, it would be an amazing story, but it would be, it's way better than Breaking Point because it actually has a fucking happy you, ending. You should, you should write it down, dude. Like legit, that's going to be like a drama. Be a banger. Big ass drama. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, this you, is you should, the, you obviously that. I'd get that guy who played like Draco or fucking Malfoy to play a certain character in the, you know whatever you know, you know what I was doing there anyway <laughs> the, this is the biggest change though on Fnatic right they I, I like to characterize this change as they basically traded wisdom for knowledge by bringing Miffy on um, instead of Young Buck, because ordinarily we would just talk up Miffy as how insane he is in terms of his game knowledge, and that's true. But if a lot of these personalities do continue to clash with Infanatic, you don't necessarily need someone who has incredible game knowledge. A lot of that is already existing on your team. You may need someone who has the wisdom of Young Buck, who knows which words to say at the right time, who knows how to behave, who knows what when he shouldn't be doing something you know like knowing when not to interfere is also a very strong talent you need to have as a coach like someone like young buck would be necessary if the personalities keep clashing if they don't clash miffy is perfect but i worry that they don't have anyone to fill this void that young buck do you think the personalities won't clash because yeah if they they will clash but this looks like a really dangerous cocktail for me yeah, yeah that, that's why I'm saying it's a bit risky roster. You know, it's a bit, uh, it's higher potential, but higher risk. So we'll see how it works out. At the very least, if it fails, it won't be because of Miffy that it fails, right? Miffy has an advantage very few coaches do, which is that he has automatic buy-in from basically every sure. fucking player in the league. You put him on any team, no player will complain that he is there. Every player will listen to him and no player will ever view him in their head as the obstacle, right? Um, so Miffy will never be the reason why that team fails, but he may not be the perfect coach for that team. I would love to have seen it if Origin just straight up upgraded Miffy to coach. Sure. Right, something like this. A team I mean, that is Miffy somewhat would be, I think Miffy would be a really good coach in, in Medlines, honestly. Like, yeah. uh, with the rookies, you mean? With the rookies, yeah. Right. Because yeah. Miffy yeah. is so good in working with uh, new players, uh, and he's so su- he's super smart as well, and everyone respects him well. So, yeah, I think uh, he has so much to like teach the players that are younger and they're not experienced. I feel like 
that he would uh, work very well in Mad Lions, for example, I think. Yeah, it seems to me also that that Mad Lions roster only really has one personality that is stubborn somewhat, which is perfectly fine if they are the four aren't. Um, so Miffy wouldn't run into any personality clashes there. Uh, so he could just be full on game knowledge and that team would that team would perform incredibly well in swing uh, if Miffy was there. Yep. I think so. Okay. Right, let's jump over then actually to Mithy's former team. Another obviously was a top prospect at one point last year's OG Origin. So in this squad, they kept Alfari, they kept Nuke Duck, and then they swapped. Obviously, Cersei left. We'll get to that later. Uh, no, no, Cersei came to this team and Cold yep. went out. In fact, Cold is not even in the league. Yep. And then you have in the bot lane, you brought in Upset, replacing Patrick, who, I mean, we'll get into that in a minute. And then the big shock is you decided to go for an oceanic player, this guy called Destiny, not literally the guy who's just screaming and saying slurs in fucking StarCraft 2. Actually, I mean, I don't know if this guy says slurs, but he wasn't playing StarCraft 2 at least anyway. So, and then, yeah, they brought in this guy from the oceanic region. So let's just start there. Like, veteran, this is a, the old core was one of your favorites. In fact, I know you have a very, very high opinion of Cold relative to most yep. other people who followed the league. That was one of the yeah, jungles yeah, yeah. I think you differ with the most. So what do you yep. think of the new lineup? Okay, so to clarify, for me, Cold um, pre Rift Rivals was the best jungler in Europe. Not Yankos, not Boxer, not, I mean, obviously not Boxer, not any of these guys. Cold was just the best, and Cold was still the best jungler of the year for me until he collapsed. Um, and collapsed Cold. We don't exactly know why yet. There appears to be like medical issues involved. <laughs> a lot of stuff has happened behind the scenes that we aren't privy to yet. The cold has promised us that he will. Yeah, spill he will say it. Yeah, soon. yeah, he'll he'll eventually spill. Also, we'll just wait on that. Um, but Xerxes is not that player that cold was. Xerxes has never been as good as uh, cold was at that point. Xerxes has way too many decisions that he makes where there is something that needs to occur in a lane on the side that he is on and then he will think okay i do a camp first and then do that this pattern was what generally speaking put splice behind in a lot of early games it definitely put them behind in mid games a lot um this kind of delay in decision making that you would never see someone like self-made do or you'd never see someone like cold do where what needs to occur on the map always took precedence over economy this ended up giving yep. Xerxes one of the highest uh, goal differentials at 15 and people tried to use that to say that he was a really strong early game jungler but this guy was not fixing the map to get that um so it's it's a downgrade um bot lane is upset destiny i obviously have not seen much of destiny at all but i question why you would feel the need to go to australia for support players um did you not see where I got flamed for that? Where I did a tweet. I even did it fairly tame for my standards because the thing is, I don't know yeah. Destiny, so I didn't want to flame him like directly. Yeah. But I just essentially said, like, it's a bit, it's a bit whack that OGs basically like ignoring the European support talent pool. Yeah. Like, what there isn't another support worth trying. Now, to be fair, I will say an element that I've mentioned before that is like sort of the dirty secret behind the scenes. Everyone knows is that just because Origins involved with like the Astralis group, etc., they don't have loads of money. Like that also makes it look like. Maybe that was where they say, skimped on the budget. And so trying that guy saves you cash or something like that. Like I haven't heard, <laughs> I personally hadn't heard any like crazy rumor that this guy was godlike or anything. I've also uh, thought uh, about the fact that the fish is friends of Papa Smithy, who's an Australian caster. Okay. Yeah. And obviously well, I mean, picks him up, yeah. Honestly, I like, I, what I see from this is that, uh, there is a lot like support for me is one of the worst, uh, roles in LAC overall, like as a skill level. And I have to say, there's a lot of supports, uh, upcoming talents that are going to be very good. Is there yeah. someone should have been in this but, uh, in this le in LEC who isn't at the moment at spot? Still back. Uh, oh, there we go. Still back is playing real well. Actually, he he surprises he surprised like it took a while for him to get used to the role, but right now he's playing so phenomenally well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's crazy how well he's playing. the The role fit him so well. And uh, then you have. Uh, Players that are upcoming talents like Labrov, you know. Yes. Uh, so th I, there's a lot of I could I could keep going on. You know, the guys that got into LAC. There's Prime that, that that I play with. He he's definitely upcoming a support talent as well. There's a lot of young players Home. on support role that basically they are gonna be really good in a year or so, right? Right. And I feel like Origin didn't want to gamble on taking a rookie with upset. Well, and upset is you know like. He's a player that like likes to play around himself. He likes to have like a you know like a really good support. And if they would take a gamble on having a, a bad support for upset, it 
might have been bad. So I yeah. feel like they just signed uh, Destiny for this. Like a, you know, he's a he's a player that has been winning in uh, in Oce- Oceanic, and then he just basically has a lot of experience. So they feel <laughs> like he's not gonna choke, he's not gonna underperform, and he's gonna keep the level he has instead of taking the gamble on the young talent with support. That's how I feel they, they think, right? Okay. Uh, I mean, they could have even taken the homie from BCN. He was better than Venza. Venza got like a really big reputation swing split, but the more <laughs> that I watch him, the more I think it was kind of undeserved. His laning phase wasn't really that good, and the homie was actually the better of the two. What, um, what but who, who hyped up Venza? Venza? Venza. I mean, Venza, when it came to swing Aha, split... Sorry, sorry. I misunderstood. Sorry. Okay. I misunderstood um, the player. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. This, um, but w- this is why I always open with Steelback because I actually disagree with you. Steelback's good now. Steelback's yeah, LEC Steelback ready good, now. Yes, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. Yes, yes, still, yes. still, Steelback understands League of Legends, not just support matchups. If this guy ever got an advantage two v two, he won the entire map and caused every other player in LDLC to become giga overrated. Yep. Which is why yep. Ike is now playing in North America. Are people uh, the, in, light of, in light of the conversation around freeze? Are people just thinking that Steelback is the old AD carry from a long time ago? And are they thinking like that? They're just not yeah. a good player without looking into it. I have to say, I was shitting on Steelback when he was playing AD carry, right? But I have to like <laughs> say, so like even I, who was absolutely <coughs> hating Steelback, yeah, yeah. I'm saying that he's fucking good right now, and yeah. the LAC team should have taken him, right? Oh no, but I remember that. That was actually here's the thing, Freeze. That was when you learned your lesson. You came at Reckless. I don't know what the fuck you think you're doing there. Like you were never going to win that battle. Like that guy literally has like like you know that meme where it's like a little baby sleeping and there's that soldier getting full of shot and arrow. That's all his <laughs> fans, mate. Like he's got the million fans in the world that like, you'll never get to him. I've tried. I've fired nukes, everything. So here's the thing, right? <laughs> What's mad is you picked the right target on that one. You went for seal back. The problem is it still slightly backfired because people were saying, like, but it's Freeze isn't even in AC. Because if you remember, I got in on that. When Steelback tried to reply to you, I did just tell Steelback, like, Freeze, you are aware Freeze is better than you will ever be at, like, League of Legends as an AD carry. I don't think you appreciate that, quite frankly, but whatever. You have to, guess what? The strong do what they can, the weak suffer what they must, Steelback. And fair play, he just roll swapped to support, as a bad AD carry should, and just yeah. then realised, right, now all I have to know is how to play my own lane. Cool, now I'm sick. No, honestly, I, like, respect. All, hands respect. down, all respect to Steelback that he, like, understood. Uh, that that he should roll swap to support. Maybe you know, maybe I should do that as well. I should have done that as well. But I'm a stubborn motherfucker who's uh, if he sees a wall, he keeps running into the wall. So I don't feel like roll swapping to support. And uh, here's my dream. Really with you, you know, like in uh, movies, like especially American, like sci-fi movies, love this trope where you have like this weird guy who seems like he might be the devil. They did it in Rick and Morty, where he just appears in town and he offers people sort of like he offers them something tempting, but if they accept it, obviously it's like cursed or something. It fucks their life up, right? This is what I would give you right now. I would just tell you, like freeze, you know. If you were to roll swap and play for, I can't tell you the team, but I could get you into the LEC and you will play a long time as a support. But then if you say yes, tomorrow I secretly have veto power and I get you into as to the support of Forgiven. And not only are you getting hard flamed, but you have to watch someone do everything you want to do, but will never again be able to do <laughs> as the support. Up, you, exactly. That's the most evil way I could do that. <laughs> yes, but... that would be so bad. <laughs> That would just yeah, I, your, uh, I had the taste the uh, in H2K, though. Like, I had the taste of that in yes. H2K when uh, <laughs> oh, Forgiven yeah. was playing ADC. I was just sitting there, and he's like, damn, dude, he's top four in, in Worlds, you know. Like, maybe I could do that, too. Yeah, that was pretty bad. That was pretty bad. Not going to lie. Okay, one thing I have to say about this team, though, veteran. Like, well, like, every, This is open to everyone, though. We need to have the discussion about upset here. Because what I said earlier about Humanoid... Right. The difference is Humanoid only played one year and I actually think in a team that absolutely limited his even ability to show if he was some beast like mad fucking killer, etc. He, like, he did what he could. Yep, did still did pretty well. The problem is this, right? Upset has been like everyone in the world who liked Upset was like this, right? This Upset kid's going to be fucking God. Like, hey, get ready. I mean, uh, oh, wait a second. Sorry. Starting now. No, no, wait. So starting now. It's like, well, wait, 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 wait. This time. Listen, this time. He's in Schalke now. Starting now, right? And then, like, I've been waiting, mate. Like, I keep waiting. I see games where he's very good. I see times where his team looks shit. And I think, yeah, he is the only one carrying. I haven't quite seen the level that I was promised, though. So, in this team veteran, is this where I finally get to see it from upset? I will reiterate what I said years ago when when we first started this, after I had just been, like, coaching upset 
um, and when I first started going on on your shows, and upset was first going to LEC, this guy has a preconceived notion of what AD Carry should be, and he stuck to that from way too early in age. And he needed a team that was going to break him out of that comfort zone he had created for himself, where only Sven could basically be a strong AD Carry. And he took his imitation of Sven with all of the flaws Sven had as well, like his over prioritization mid lane and all of this. Um, and he never came out of that hole. He never became one of these limit pushing players that eventually become the very best, right? He was never going to be, even though he sucks up enough to forgive him that forgiven would tweet that, um, the next forgiven or anything like this. He was always kind well, of stuck in this preconceived notion. Yeah, and like never for had... me, sorry to interrupt you, but for me, it's like if he, the way he plays, yep. if he would be playing like that in season three, season four, he would be the forgiven, right? Yep. Like, the way is like he has a he has a certain play style and he's set to it like you're saying and and that play style was so good so good in season three season four he was he would be at the same level as forgiven basically if he would be playing in that uh, season but this season it's completely different and you can't play like that all the time and that's why it all, sometimes <coughs> it works sometimes it doesn't work yeah you have to be you have to have more play styles now, nowadays you have to be more adaptive uh, to how you want to play as 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 a, as a ad carry basically I, actually, I would oh, like yeah, to, come on. to yeah, link jump this in. theme to the, the Patrick theme because for me, both Patrick and Upset have been ADCs that maybe have been more hyped than the results yeah, yeah. they have given in the server. So what do you think, Freeze, about Patrick in last year and comparing it to Upset that took his job, basically? I feel like Patrick last year was kind of lost on what to... It, it, it felt like everyone played the game instead of actually Patrick playing the game. That, that's at least how it felt for me. Because uh, he, he got to this team where everyone had a big personality. Everyone was a, basically a veteran and had a lot of experience. And he was a player that basically didn't have that experience. And for me, Patrick is a player that needs to play himself. Basically, he needs to know what he has to be doing himself. And he, he could very well know what he has to be doing in that. But in, in Origin, it felt like everyone's telling him how to play the game. And then it just didn't work for him. I feel like uh, you know I what I mean. Feel like there's an issue with the fact that his support had very inconsistent hands, uh, and Patrick himself was one of the only super aggressive players on that team. Yeah, uh, and if Miffy can't mechanically execute on the two v two properly, then suddenly Patrick doesn't look good this game because Miffy. Yeah, fucked up. but is it like Miffy controlling Patrick's keyboard or something? Because I, I mean, if you are really a super high talent player, I think we sh we should be see more games where he's like really trying. For example, self selfmade didn't have the best team, but you could see he was like playing on the edge of every team fight, even if they were losing. For me, Patrick has not lived up to, to the hype at all. Sure. And even if Upset has this set way of thinking, at least he has some games where you say, holy fuck, this guy is so insane. Yes. And I think that Patrick maybe d does not deserve as much hype as he, he was getting. Go rewatch G2 versus Origin first game of Summer Split. Like the, that that was the first game I can think of off the top of my head. Obviously, there's like a lot more than that. But, but that's the first game I can specifically point you yeah, to where Patrick actually, was absolutely we can play playing. The, we can yeah, play yeah but it's, it's like that's the season, right? Aspect, okay, not using E to, to cut Rengar out. I'm not saying he's a bad player, but by any means. I'm just saying he's not a top tier talent on the server when you compare it to people like Perks, for example. Put it this way, there's an easy way to resolve this. Is Veteran arguing that Patrick should have stayed and Upset shouldn't? Yeah, I am, because I think Patrick was testing that roster in the way that okay. the roster needed to be tested. I don't. I think the problem with Upset, and the reason why Upset will optically look better than Patrick sometimes, is because Patrick is willing to put himself in situations where there is a certain level of play you need to be able to do, and sometimes he doesn't reach that level of play. Upset will never put himself in that position. So Upset looks like a bit more of a perfect player, but as a result, he becomes a limiting factor to his team in those regards. Yeah, there's, there's a difference as well in those two players as a, a Patrick is more like you know upset as a player that will be super confident in forcing other players to play around him and just basically that's the only way you know he's just like this is the way play, we play and no other way well Patrick is a player where I know him very well as well personally and he's a player when like he doesn't have a strong personality he's not going to be forcing other players to play the way he wants to be playing and he will try, you know, like in, in the springs, uh, in the in the summer split, in the start of the season, he played, <coughs> he played aggressively. But if he keeps trying and it 
won't work, he will just stop trying, sort of. He, he's going to be like, there's a big difference in personalities in those two players where Epset will force everyone to play around him and Patrick is going to try to like adapt to everyone in that team, even though it doesn't okay. fit him. You know, like the higher level play of League of Legends is... I'll, I'll keep saying it's all about mentality and uh, and about the the head. You know, it's just it's crazy. How, like the skill is almost the same, but your head is basically saying how good you're you're gonna be. And can, in a can I, I be a little bit of a bad person, Freeze, and ask you who would you take? Yeah, who, who, would you, who would you in, take uh, the origin? Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, but not knowing the roster, like you have five blank slates and you're set to pick an ADC, upset or Patrick for a new team. Hoping to win LEC. I mean, that depends, right? If I would be taking a weaker players, I would take upset and force the team to play around upset. Big, uh, it depends on like the if I had to choose for if I had if if I could get the best players, right? If I could get the best players in in the league, I would choose Patrick on that roster. But if I have a, a players that are not that good, I would choose upset, basically. Yeah. Okay. Because that's why, for me, this uh, this actually is... I won't say like, the last chance salute. He's still a very young player, obviously, and he's still got many years left in his career. But in terms of, like, if he wants to keep the hype going and deliver upon it, I'll give him one caveat, which is I don't know how good the support player will be. So if the support player is bad, I'll give him a pass on that. But if the support player is at all competent, you cannot give me any excuses after this year. Because literally, your jongler, for all his faults definitely looked like he thought he knew what he was doing he wasn't one of those guys who just lost on the map and then in terms of the solo laners if you want everyone to play around you as an AD carry this is your fucking wet dream mate like these are the two most consistent solo laners probably in fucking Europe look at these players like they're all experienced they've all been in the world it's like this is the dream lineup for you I say, except I say like the sport angle I don't know about that one so this should be the season where he goes ham he should literally be contending for best ADC there's also one uh way of hope here that we haven't brought up which is that in 2018 summer split when nuke duck and upset were on one team the team actually started playing around nuke duck and we saw bot lane just being ezreal Braum and top lane just being malachi and then nuke duck was pulling out the zed and shit like this to carry shulker all the way to the finals so if anyone can reign in upset historically it may be nuke duck like remember when kaiser Braum was a thing nuke duck was their carry not upset like this guy can clearly take charge in that regard and i know upset has a lot of high regard for nuke duck so mm -hmm. maybe it could work out in that favor i also just want to say that with freezer's answer he understands an aspect of roster building that a lot of fucking actual roster builders don't understand which is that if you have a lot of weaker players the team needs to be as decisive as possible so even if this tendency of upset would be bad on a team that could actually have a really high high ceiling it suddenly becomes good because it would make that team of weak players decisive right uh which is which is what amazing always does on his teams you know like he's not necessarily the smartest guy on the on the planet but he's one of the most decisive guys and he'll make your team decisive as a five-man unit in terms of uh let me think what would be a fun team to go to now oh i mean the obvious one let's do upsets old team so upsets old team schalke retained oduamna uh, they kept, I think they kept the same coaching staff, right? Didn't they keep yeah, uh, they Dylan kept, Falco? Okay, they so they kept Dylan Falco. Jungle, I don't think it's confirmed yet, is it? Because it was going to be Memento maybe come back? Because I know Trick the, left. That's the only, I think it's the only player that is not a role or like spot in LAC that's not com, like com, rumored, you know? Right. No one knows okay. what's going to happen. And then they kept Abadagi in mid lane and then they brought in a new bot lane. So they had an upgrade AD carry. Yeah, I said it, motherfucker. It's an upgrade. So I, I don't even care. You know what? I, here's the thing, veteran. I'll do a mini rant. I'm not going to go to a big one. I'll probably do a separate video about it. Because someone actually asked me when I do, like I do a, a Patreon discussion with the people who like pay, pay way too much money because they just like my shit too much. So what I, what I do on that show is, because no one's going to watch it because it's just basically some nerds asking me questions they want to know, is I do sometimes drop little jewels of things like like more in-depth thought on some I think or like some behind the scenes info because I know no one's going to watch it anyway and basically the guy asked me he put me on the spot and said like what level will Forgiven come back at and what I essentially said was this is if he's coming back to actually compete and he has been playing before the split as he has I don't actually believe in all that shit of like, oh, it takes like a, you know, like a split to learn the meta again and how competitive player. I think if you're a player like Forgiven and your mechanics are at the level, 
You can say what you like about stylistic aspects. You should come back and still literally be immediately top five AD carry. And so based on what I know about his work ethic, especially his mentality, if he loses to people, I actually think by the end of even the first split, he will be one of the best AD carries in Europe. I don't give a fuck what people think. People can go, oh, but you, you said, yeah, I said that about Froggen as well in the in the LCS. Where are we all at now? I've said that about loads of players. So has when he's come back. So I actually genuinely think he's going to come straight back in the league and be very, very good. Uh, I know that they are. I know that they are stomping in scrims like nothing else. Right oh, now. and then oh, I forgot to add uh, the support is dreams, by the way. And I actually think, I mean, me and Richard have discussed SK many times. You almost couldn't handpick someone better to bring forgive him back into the league with and put him in the lane with, in my opinion. Yeah, so he can't understand his flame. That's a, great, that's a great point. That is a great point. And he's Korean, so he's used to literally getting abused when anything happens. Because by the way, I even I've, I've told this story before. The way I learned the Korean word for bitch is I went to a LAN cafe and I was just playing some like normals games a league. And then they kept typing this shit. Like if I even missed one targons on like a basic minion, they would type this word and I like Googled it and it's just like it was bitch. They were just calling me a bitch because I missed one fucking CS as Thresh or something like I was like, is this, the, is this a normal player? Like, what, holy fuck, what's it like in the pro teams? So I agree, like, he's actually probably, like, you know, basically he spent his whole life preparing to play with Forgiven. <laughs> so I, so <laughs> I've given a lot of praise to Dreams for what he added to SK. The most of the things that he added on SK were out of lane, though. Um, in lane, um, so in lane, I could say he's a limiting factor to Forgiven, but I don't think Forgiven has ever played of a player in lane that has been able to keep up with him in the support role. He's never had that um, many base supports. Even Vander was kind of a, a weaker point when he had him. Yeah, Vander was a kind of a weaker point at that point, but Forgiven is also, Forgiven just also understood laning phase in season five beyond what at season six, I mean, beyond what most other AD carries in, in the league did or any other AD carry in the league did. And the concepts that Forgiven brought to the league in season four were literally entire concepts that changed the metagame of AD carry forever. So there was a massive catch-up period. Um, and right now, I wouldn't say that Dreams would be one of the sports you put in to emphasize what's strongest about Forgiven, which is his laning phase. However, out of lane, I still think he's one of the best sports they could take. And I think he's better than Ignor, to be honest. I, Ignor was one of the most overrated people that I, has ever played in the European League, except for the fact they played in the same split as Gorilla. Um, but Dreams was always the better out of the uh, three Korean supports that we had, and he's probably the only one that should end up being kept. I still think that there are other supports that we could take in, um, but I, I can understand why they ended up going with Dreams uh, on this particular roster, and I have very high hopes for Forgiven himself. I, they are stomping in scrims right now, and he is king of spring, right? So okay. we can at least expect them to do incredibly well in spring split. So Now I know, Cabra, that if Reckless is like mainstream Catholicism, like the religion that rules the world, brainwashes people and makes them believe absolute shit that's not true and will never be true, especially about the future, then obviously, I know it's it's a bit of a call out right there, but luckily at the moment, (laughs) Christianity isn't the religion that will have me killed, so I'm willing to call them out. So in that scenario, Cabra, I know that you are firmly in the same camp as many of us in this call, in the Protestant church against that of Forgiven, which is the truth true way to play any carry the true mindset of how to play any carry and if you don't like it then get the fuck out the lane so where are you coming down on this one (laughs) 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 i I think he's like i think he's really 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 super talented but uh i don't know i i don't have it all with me that uh this will be that great of a of a game for him to come back. I I do not know him uh, backstage, quote unquote. So I do not know how he works with teams. But in my opinion, my opinion is that you need to be a lot more flexible in how to think about bottling nowadays. Right. How you play around its pressure, and even we, we see like uh, playing wave clear and allow uh, enabling your support. Um, for example, James is mm. really good at this yeah. to roam might be even optimal in many metas. So I think he will be really, really good, but I worry that he will have a problem like upset where he's making a team monodimensional. And if you look at his carries, he has Odo Amne that doesn't really want to carry as much and hasn't had a mid laner in quite a while. And he has Abedage and maybe Memento who didn't have the, the best uh, uh, 2019. Sure. I don't know. I don't think the, that he... <coughs> Okay, maybe it's a good thing that he's uh, so obsessive about his lane because he will have uh, a lot of resources to to work with, I think. 
I've always thought it's a bit of a misnomer that Forgiven demands to be played around. His play style somewhat demands to be played around, but he himself as a person does not complain if we don't pay attention to his lane. In fact, very often he's complaining that the jungler isn't getting advantages on the top yep. side of the map while he is 2v3 on bot. He isn't yeah, optimally 2v3 sorry, on bot. The uh, position if I may lane is in. ask you a question about this. Go on. Uh, if Forgiving is being super aggressive and the enemy jungler is quote unquote forced to come because uh, like he's playing dumb, isn't this sort of forcing your jungler in maybe not the best times to play around him? Even if it is by trading on the other side of the map and maybe fucking a good back, a good wave. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't think if this style will hold up. Yeah, that's the, this that's is the, why the, the issue is what, what you're saying. The real issue here is what you nailed earlier, which is if the game is radically different enough from what Forgiven knows, obviously he's only been playing solo queue, then yeah, that's going to fuck him because the old Forgiven, it's literally a story that famously happened on Summon and Insight when we had Yankos on ages ago, which is when I asked him, this is obviously back in 2016, before the world's run, when I asked him what was it like to be the genre of Forgiven, he told this story, which is like one of the great anecdotes, where he tells a story where exactly what you're saying has happened. Forgiven Given plays, 80% pushed up in the lane like he always did. He's pushing the other bot lane in. And obviously, the enemy jungler starts coming down to get the free gank off. And then what happens is Yankos starts mirroring it and coming down. And then Forgiven says to him, like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, we're going to win this 2v3. You should be taking, like, a camp or something. Like, something, like, ridiculous. Like, something like a jungler is just like... <laughs> what like a fucking dog <laughs> trying to look at a card trick or something. i don't i just don't understand like and the, and that and the reason why that's one of the most baller anecdotes ever is because it actually shows exactly what veterans saying it's yeah. like what's fucked is it's not that he thinks right you're worse than me so you better do everything i'll say and it's all on me it's like he thinks right you're worse than me why the fuck aren't you better start being better you should be the best jongler <laughs> Yeah, I, I think what Cabra's issue is is that Forgiven may have unrealistic expectations because sure. he's right, the, the understanding of the game has evolved to the point where there are better things to do than gank or take a camp at that point. In, right down to just getting a reset off at that point might be a better thing to do. Um, and Forgiven may not see it that way. And I think the biggest issue Forgiven will find is that if he does want to play, we should say, an aggressively strong weak side play style he's doing that without ever really allowing his support to leave the lane and attribute to the other side of the map or to midsection which is what every other bot lane will be doing now and we have to see how forgiven adapts to that if forgiven will adapt to that if uh, dreams will be allowed to do what has made dreams so good which is his understanding of roaming which is ahead of supports in spring split um and if he's not allowing dreams to do that then dreams maybe isn't the player would want there at that point maybe you even did want ignore there because that's all Ignar does. Ignar doesn't fucking do anything around the map. He just stays bot and demands ganks. Like, yep. Oh, and I'll also throw in, like, there's no... You're not playing 2v3 when the fucking jungler's Elise and the support is Nautilus. Like, that... Those, what 2v3s are you winning there, motherfucker? Like, you're just CC'd. You're dead. Like, like I'd, I'd, I'd call for the jungler at that point. In fact, now we have to train Forgiven, the most basic level of League of Legends, to flame the jungler when they doesn't come. <laughs> no, but my, my question is, if you would have Forgiven to have his support roam all the time... Why yeah. did you sign up for Given? That's true. It's 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 a very contradictory kind of playstyle that he has, and whether it survives in the current meta game will be interesting. Because if it doesn't, how will Forgiven adapt to that? Will Forgiven adapt to that? Will Forgiven yep. then show everyone that he can be a player that is as uh, malleable as I'm sorry to say it, Reckless, who who actually was the epitome of a weak side AD carry sure. in Summer Split allowing Hillisang to, to, to be insane. Um, like, will he be able to adapt like that? He at least... I mean, twice, so. sadly, we've already done these convos a million times, so we won't go into it. But, like, it goes without saying, the, I, like, I actually agree. One of the weirdest things about Forgiven is... I, don't, I never understood how whack Fnatic fans were that they tried to contrast not only the results of the players, but act like Forgiven had the fucking supports Reckless did. So I never got like how that's fair in any way because this guy always played with inferior supports his entire career. The real dream, which we always used to say, but now will sound stupid because he could never get in this team, was I always wanted to see him and Mickey X. That oh, was the God. obvious spot lane I wanted to see play together. Yeah, uh, that, that would just run into the problem that no one would talk Actually, it just occurred to me that... You don't need to talk. You just have to shut up and listen to, like, the announcer, like, a, a kill has... Well, I don't know what the fucking saying, <laughs> League of Legends, you know, like, sort of champion has been killed or some shit, you know. We had a problem in HUK initially that Vander also wasn't very talkative initially. And, <laughs> I uh, wonder why. Yeah. 
Yeah, he wasn't very talkative initially either. And uh, as a result, whenever Yankos approached bot lane, he had no idea what was going on because no one was telling him what was going on in lane, what they were planning to do, what they could do, what cooldowns were up, anything like this. And then they had to be trained into talking a lot more. And if you remember the Misfits roster where Mickey X and Hans Sammer was on there, I, I assume you just run into the same issue where if the game isn't over at 20 minutes, then the game is still, you're, you're just going to lose the game because no one is talking on the bot lane. Otherwise, well, I would what, love to see if you can Basically, it. what prompted Veteran to realize he had to increase the comms of the bot lane and support in that sense was, like, you know, he just, Forgiven was just like, in the silence, he would just fill the silence and just say what he wanted. So he goes, why are you not talking, Vandy? You're not like that other bloody Polish guy, like drunk or something. They were like, right, Vandy, you've got to talk about it. Like, talk a lot. Like, that's a little in-joke for anyone who knows anything that was going on in that team, by the way. Like, <laughs> anyway, let's actually, like, as a team in general, though, not just Forgiven-centric, like, it sounds like people are pretty down because basically Forgiven and Dreams are the best part of this team. And aside from that, I mean, let's face it, it is just the same team as last year, but in the spring. So it can it actually be like a team that is relevant. It just sounds like it's borderline I, playoffs. I honestly think they'll do better than Mad Lions, for example. Like this this team, at least in spring, you know. I, I feel they'll be top five, most likely. Which team are you talking about? Uh, Schalke. Schalke. Oh, Schalke. Yeah, no, they'll, I kind of, they'll, they'll, I kind of feel like they will do better than the than Midlands in the in the spring, honestly. I actually think, although Omni played some really good last two years, it's yeah. just that maybe the teams okay. didn't fit him as well. But I think he's still like uh, contending for top three top lane. Yeah. By the way, I'm glad just, you said that because otherwise, yeah. Fon will accuse me of being biased if I if I if I no, said no, that. No. <laughs> I think Odo is really good as well. No, no, I, mate, my theory, my take on Odo is obvious. Like after seeing how many years this guy's played and with how many different teammates, the idea again that he's just a shit player who cannot ever play League of Legends, doesn't have working hands, and forgot the game, just doesn't add up. Instead, I look and I see he had constant problems with his jungler. Then he got a fucking jungler that was never going to come anywhere. His coach essentially on my show admitted, like, I don't know what we're doing with him. We just left him alone. Like, what more do you need? <laughs> Like, do you need them to all write a, a sign of fucking affidavit saying, like, we fucked this guy? Like, yeah, that's it. So I'm absolutely up for him coming back. I'm totally up for that happening, you know. I will say, though, just to put a, a nail in this topic, I'm now going to sadly have to excommunicate fucking Cabra from the Protestant Church of Forgiven. How dare you not believe in our Lord and Saviour? We we will not tolerate heretics that's here, sir. Although I'm his man. <laughs> no, no way Forgiven thinks that. No way. And they're very good friends, actually. Yeah, uh, Forgiven's also a weird guy. This is also an angle people never bother bringing up about Forgiven because they always paint him in such extreme terms. And then, by the way, the same person will go mental if you paint, like, reckless in extreme terms, right? One of the things about Forgiven that's actually mad underrated is if you have the right attitude, he will actually accept you being shit. He won't flame you. If you have the right attitude and you seem like you're trying your best, he won't flame you. He flames the people who he thinks don't try hard enough, don't do yeah. well. Enough. That's it. So, for example, this is not a joke. Everyone remembers old school, that fucking support player called Melixia, who was like a player from Super Hot Crew who got instantly Melixia. replaced. Sorry, sorry, yes, Melixia, right? He used to literally say him and Unlimited were really good supports. And I used to say, forgiven, it, this is like one-on-one -on -one to me privately. I was like, motherfucker, there's no one else in the room. They're not even here to hear that. So why are you saying lovely things that are obviously fucking bullshit? Like, what you mean is you like them as a person, so you accept their flaws. I said, that's some that's some bullshit. You would never judge your rivals by those standards. So bizarrely, I actually think it'll be fairly accepted as some of these players. It's just, again, can they perform? But that's the trick. Like, forgiving fills you with rage, and if you, if you can accept it and pretend you are working for this generous god, he will be pleased. But actually, he's just super, super angry that he can't keep flaming you anymore. So he has no way of keeping himself, of having his good self image and also flame you. So he has to pretend you are like okay. a top player, and he believes it in every point in his life. Could be. Could well be. Right, anyway. I, I think we've we've run that one dry because so many of the traditional players. What well, about? Can, can I say one yeah, thing then yeah, about the non-traditional one? Because I think actually this meta is pretty good for Abadage, because uh, mid lane doesn't have the same level of importance that it did last year. 
um, in the the way that the preseason changes are, at least right now, um, which means that Abadage doesn't necessarily isn't necessarily forced to be relevant until third Drake comes into account. Um, so the fact that they have Abadage, who hasn't historically performed very well on this team, could be fine, given that I think side lanes matter a lot more than they used to, especially with the added importance of Grump. So having forgiven an Odo on that team could be really perfect, and Abadage wouldn't necessarily weigh them down like he could. Oh, before. you've also, by the way, just just reminded me of another. It might seem counterintuitive pointing it immediately. Right. Initially, you would think like Abadage, who literally wrote an article about himself saying he's like introverted and took time to speak. You might naively think, Thorin, why would you want to put him with Forgiven? Because if we have a fucking weak side Odo Amne and an AD carry who thinks he's going at 100 miles an hour, mid lane's going to have to do something. And if, if, if Forgiven can't break this guy out of his shell... That's it. Like, at that point in time, he's never going to come out. So I actually think it's the same scenario as, like, fucking Dardock going to TSM. It's like, oh, but they always break all the jungles. Yeah, try breaking this guy, mate. Like, let's just see how you manage that. Like, we'll see who breaks first. So I wanted, to, I, I actually hope this, like, busts Abadai open and he becomes a sick player. Maybe. Maybe. Might be, yeah. It might happen, actually. Or he just he just breaks mentally and we never Well, see then we we'll just get rid of him. No problem. Like, listen, I'm not, I always say this. I'm not here to give people lovely lives and to cheer everyone on. I'm here to watch the best League of Legends. And as the Korean scene shown us, if that leaves a broken pile of toys on the side, who gives a fuck? <laughs> I've got the new Power Man here. It's the shit. So anyway, I'm not sure that that's like the take like a lot of the coaches want to believe, but you know, whatever. <laughs> Again, I'm not here for people. I'm here for League of Legends. I only watch shit inside the server. As far as I'm concerned, it's the Matrix, bitch. Put me back in there. Just make me someone famous, you know, like an actor or something. Whatever. Maybe this is the Matrix right now. Maybe it's the simulation. But I, if I am Cypher, I picked this pretty shit life to live. I could have picked a lot of better <laughs> ones, but whatever. You know. I want right? to be famous is now only famous in esports. <laughs> Sad thing is, eventually that'll be incredibly famous, mate. When all the other sports collapse, I'll probably run in this motherfucker. So you ask for thing. your wish, and the same guy freezed it. Yes, exactly. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He goes, "Do you want to be really famous? Do you want to make a lot of money?" I go, "Yeah, of course." They go, "Right, you're stuck doing a children's video game into your late thirties. You works great, but everyone says you just do it for clicks and you hate reckless." Like, "Oh shit, I didn't think of the consequences. Oh, I didn't think of the consequences." And then I just cry with all the hundred dollar bills, like the Woody Harrelson gif. So no, anyway, let's move on to another team now. So we've done a lot of the big ones. Right, just because of the Young Buck discussion and the fact that they had a bunch of rookies last year, I feel compelled to do the XL discussion. Because yeah. first of all, in theory, veteran, based on what you said earlier, this looks terrible from the outside in as much as like, what the fuck did Young Buck do to the league that he ca- he has to go to XL? But what if, if what you're saying and, and what people have suggested about his ability to patch holes isn't actually going to a team without the best players, a brilliant way to show you great and potentially do something good. Oh, definitely. Like, if he ever wanted to secure his title as the undisputed best of all time goat faker of coaching, then he needs to take this team to Worlds. He takes this team to Worlds, it's it's over. Like, no one can ever deny that this is the best coach that Europe has ever produced and potentially the best coach in the world, right? Um but the, I, I mean, it would be a lot easier if he didn't have Expect and Mickey on the team. Uh, it would be a lot easier if this team didn't appear to be made up almost entirely of people who got fired last minute from everywhere else. Um, it, it's, it's definitely starting from like a low point. Players on this team aren't necessarily horrible individually. Obviously, Mickey was like a very, very, very low tier mid lane. Run through the other players. So, who are the other ones? So, Mickey's in the mid lane. Obviously, he was already there. Patrick Obviously, Expect was there. Patrick and Norskeren, so there we yeah, go. Patrick yeah. from Splice, not, uh, I've got the wrong way around there. Patrick from Origin, Norskeren from Splice, if people don't remember. And Cajal is still there. Okay. Cajal is fucking it's- good. Well, here's the thing, Freeze. You've hit me on here. You've hit yet another of these if or if then scenarios I've been setting up using veterans old things. Because the problem is veteran. I learned this a long time ago. You can hype players when they're doing bad. It's like, well, they're really good on a bad team. But like the problem is when they then get a good team, you shout a lot. They have to just be good at that point. So based on what you've told us about Cadrill, Cadrill literally has to fucking be the chess master controlling the fucking board. Like he hasn't got the best players, but shouldn't in theory this be a team where he can do something? Yeah, and like with the last XL, um, he's the one that has to make something happen. Um, yep. And so long as it hasn't been massively entered in draft and he's playing Olaf of two losing lanes, you know? Um, like, he, he's the one that has to make shit happen, yeah. Yeah, I actually think that... Uh, like, I, I'm one of the people that think that having Koreans on a team is actually bad for for the team itself than having rather have a like a... Why would you just not take someone that has the same uh, culture and is slightly worse than take the Koreans that will, you know, like the worst worst thing you can do is take two Koreans in one team because those two Koreans, they will 
basically they will split the team. You will have the non-Korean team and then then the Korean teams. The yeah. two Koreans will like yeah. keep flaming everyone that's like the, all the other free players, and they will like do it in their Korean language, and no one understands, and they will keep it <laughs> yeah. themselves. And then the three others will stop flame the Koreans, and then yeah, I will like, say by the way, if you're the XL org or any org going to do this. Just have a translator that sits in the background and just over listens to what they're saying. Because here's the problem. When you're going, oh, they're very polite, aren't they? Like, oh, yes, I will say. They, I, if you could translate what they're saying to each other in Korean, phew, it'd be fucking wild, I'm telling you right now. <laughs> yep. Apparently, that was basically the only function David Lim had on that team was just to translate what Mickey was saying the whole time. Um, and Mickey was effectively in charge of the team for a bit. Um, so I can see why he ended up staying. Uh, what I don't understand is why the bot lane is what it is right now when they already had a perfectly good bot lane of Jesklin Mystiques because we are essentially looking at the same team. We are looking at the team if they had just kept Jesklin Mystiques but instead they've just bought him Patrick Moscow. It seems really strange to me. As a result, they don't really fix I've heard there were thoughts. attitude problems with uh, Jesklin, you know. That's I, I heard, heard there were attitude problems with Mystiques maybe but that was yeah. attitude problems that occurred after they essentially replaced Mystiques between Spring and Summer. Understandable so then. Yeah, so then when they brought Mystique's back, he was already a bit pissed about it, and he had basically gotten a bit lazy, is what I'd heard. I hadn't heard that there were issues with Jeskler. Um, I mean, everyone says something different, so you can't. You have to always take it with a grain of salt. Yeah, it's true, it's true. Um, but when it comes to this team, like they, it's it's not really that different from the roster that they had last split. It just has a it's, much yeah. better coach. It just has a much yeah. better coach. It's almost um, the same, basically. Obviously, Patrick's a bit better, and obviously, Norskowin is a bit better, right? But mm -hmm. functionally, the team is going to play more or less the same as when they were winning last split, as how they will win this split. Um, and if you don't, like, a chain's only as strong as its weakest link, right? Like, just if you if you grabbed Reckless and Hillisang and dropped it on this team, that doesn't make up for the fact that your top section is going to just randomly lose lane or do nothing for ages, you know? Um, and well, and like, it, the yeah. team will be mostly about, like, Cadre doing everything, and then Cadre not. He will have zero chance of fucking up because uh, it yeah. was the same last uh, last season when he was the only one doing stuff, and then the team was doing well until he fucked up. Because the moment he fucked up, no one else yeah. would do anything. Yep. So he basically has to be the guy that does everything and never fucks up, which is incredibly hard, right? Like he's talented, he has it in him, but it's it takes so much experience that he necessarily doesn't have with uh, with himself. And with the roll, right? Like he roll swap, so it's like he has to be lucky, <coughs> of not like he has to do everything and not fuck up, which is just like. But, but here's the beautiful up. thing, though. Young Buck has a very, very, very good systemized method of getting a team that doesn't know what the fuck they're doing as five people and are completely reliant on one person as five people in mid to late game to do things as five people. He has very good set plans for what they should do at those points, and. Obviously, people will be thinking you can't just like have like a set plan. This is what we do in mid game. It's not like that at all. It's like a series of very contextual plays that they're going to do. And if he if he if he gives that to this team, maybe that's enough. Given that Casual is one of the best early game junglers in the league, and Casual can probably get you through that point so long as Mickey isn't burning Flash level one on the Zir. Um, if he gets you through that point, then maybe Youngbug is enough to be the difference maker here. And then maybe they're just going to maybe maybe this team ends up being well, again if Youngbug brings this team to worlds it's indisputable maybe even if he just brings them to top four it's indisputable to be honest because no one has expectations for this team it's essentially the same team as last year so we do need to model this as let's see what happens if we switch our david Lim for young buck on last year's team you know do you have an idea of why they value mickey so highly because if i were to upgrade last year's excel i would actually kick out the the side laner i mean the solo laners i thought especially yeah. mystics was really really good yeah, they're idiots. <laughs> I will say, okay. <laughs> listen, this isn't flame. Oh. I'm just giving this to show context of what the of what the LEC thinks of players. But one of the players I referenced when we were talking when I was debating on Listen Local with Grabs as to whether or not Destiny should be in the league, is I said, What about that Mystique guy? I thought he was pretty decent yeah. in some of the games. Why is he? And then they he was just going, nah, he's overrated. But why do you import players in EU? Like, are you fucking nuts or what? Like it's just it just doesn't make sense. Over at overrated all. by who? Who the fuck talks about mystics? Like, I mean, like, no offense, but I think he was underrated, if anything. Yeah, he was. No, but just, just like, let's get to the point where, like, why are we importing players? We have the biggest talent base af after China. Yeah. Sure. We're the second best region. 
Why the fuck are we importing someone from worse leagues? I, I mean, always I, think, I think was pretty fun this year, so that's uh, an upside, I think. There's a, there, there are only two ways that import that importing people go. Okay, you're either importing someone from a better region. Okay, let's assume you're importing someone for a better region. For everyone who's going to say to freeze, you mean second after Korea or something like that? What you think Korea is a worse league? So let's say that they are importing them from a better region, right? Why would that guy say yes if he wants to be the best? He would sure. stay in his own region. So if that guy says yes, you already know. Say Chovy said yes to your multi-million dollar deal, right? You're not paying multi-million dollars for Griffin Chovy. You're not. The moment he said yes to that contract, yeah. he has mentally already put himself in a position where he's becoming something else entirely. You're paying for IMT Chovy, EG Chovy, whatever. And that the only player the guy you I think you're paying millions. I've made this point before, and obviously idiots yeah. in EU just dismiss it. The only player I would ever import basically from any region, is if Doublelift wanted to come to Europe and play in a really good EU team. Yes. It's the only one that yeah. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like, obviously, he wouldn't have a culture problem, language problem. Yeah. It's a way for him to actually upgrade his region, like veterans saying. Yeah. But as you say, like, there's no really good Korean is going to buy into that. Like, like yes. as soon as it comes, that is a warning sign, because why would they yes. do that? They're just coming for money at that point. Yeah. The Americans, you could maybe argue, are coming here not for money, but for... No, like, uh, uh, but for getting better, right? Because yeah, better chance yeah, to win. Like, for Koreans, it's literally whoever cannot make it in Korea will go to a different re region. Like, yeah. any Korean that can make it in the best league in LCK and they can make it to the best teams, they will stay in the yep. Korea and they will make it yep. in that league. Yep. The ones that are, people are importing are the ones that are leftovers that are not good enough to be in LCK. So... Yep. And people could say so that they're freeze. taking the money. Wait, 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 wait. What, what you're saying is if someone is not judged to be good enough to be in the main league, he shouldn't be respected as a player? No, no, I'm not saying that. But it's just like, you know, I would understand uh, importing, like, like, for example, NA is importing Koreans, right? I would understand that because they're much worse region. They don't sure. have the talent, necessarily the talent we have in EU. And... It's it just like that player will be significantly better than everyone else, right? But in, in EU, it's considered that we have a re really good rookies. And if you import someone that is basically playing in the second league of LCK, then or not even playing in LCK, then it's like he is going to be... He's not the best. Let's right? put it this way. Like, basically, Freeze is saying, if he had a choice between the 11th best Korean AD carry and... Fucking Kazi, he would obviously choose Kazi. No, 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 it, doesn't, no, it doesn't matter how good no. the Korean looks, I, I you know. I understand. I just wanted to to poke a bit of fun since he since he's out of LEC. I thought it was right. a fun okay. point to make. But... I see. Okay. So yeah. what what I'm saying is that if you take the third best AD carry or a world champion level AD carry from Korea, you're not importing a world championship level AD carry. That guy is not going to be a world championship level yeah, he's AD not going to try as hard. He's not, yeah, he's not going to. He's not. Right now, if Freeze got a North American offer, he would not be going there to win worlds. That is not what he would be going there to do. At best he would be trying to play so well that he gets picked up by a european team but if he is mm. doing that he will not agree to play weak side while like fucking licorice gets like an insane level of priority right he will demand yeah. that for himself because he he's playing this as a showcase and that will be suboptimal for the team but it will be objectively better for freeze so why would you ever take no offense freeze, i'm probably fucking up a few opportunities for you but why would you ever take someone like freeze who's nodding his head the whole time i'm saying this by the no, way it's true. It's true. Man, yeah it's true like if an import's coming from a better region at best they're going to play incredibly fucking selfishly to showcase themselves and you will lose as a team because of that and they will be fine with that because they're not expecting to win worlds they're not going to win worlds and if they're coming from a worse region your scouting better of being fucking phenomenal because you're by default probably getting a worse player right you have to have an insane level of scouting at that point and sure. that only really applies to destiny because there's no way the koreans still think that they are not potentially the best region on the planet. Every Korean absolutely still believes that they are. Like, that's the problem with imports. Whether you're taking them from a worse region or a better region, it's still always going to come down to one of those two things, and you're never getting the player that you think you are getting. The moment they say yes to your offer, they are already a worse player mentally, and they will never become mm -hmm. a better one. Right, let's pivot and talk about another team then. So we've already done, they were formerly Splice. We'll do the other cursed team of the LEC, which is obviously Vitality. Now, technically, most of these vitality moves are just rumored, but like based on everything behind the scenes, like they're, they're probably going to happen. Let's be real. So, the vitality lineup is they kept Cabochard, 
they kept Jack Troll, and then they brought in Skeens as the jungler, Milica as the mid laner, and Comp as the AD carry. Now, you already hinted, I can't remember if it was on air or whatever, about Comp earlier on, yeah. and the idea he's more in the reckless camp. Yeah. Like, Milica's the guy where, at least in the offseason, I've heard people now saying there's all this hype that he's like a super good player. I've never seen him play personally, I've never watched Milica's him. Milica's the guy that shot on Frog in, in EU Masters a few years ago. So something that never happened, right? Okay, so and then obviously, <laughs> I, I believe I believe actually ref, Veteran has mentioned Skeens in the past as a jungler as well on, yeah. on this show. So start us off then, Veteran. What do you think of this lineup? So I think it's actually pretty well set up. I think you do want the reckless kind of AD carry on the bot <coughs> side for two reasons. One, he's playing with Jack Troll. So why would you get a uh, lane dominant AD carry there? He's never going to be able to play hard for lane and he's just going to kill Jack Troll and stab him five times. Why would you keep Jack Troll? Isn't that the real question? Well, I've heard yes. of someone that they're getting on academy team who they could probably right. just end up okay. moving up. Uh, in right. spring summer, so maybe this is the last call of Jack Troll. Okay. Um, but I think it's good to have uh, a weak side bot lane here because you still have Cabo Shard, who, in my controversial opinion, was an S tier top laner last year uh, with Wonder. I, I think that they were top two and I think they were of equal level. I think Cabo Shard is insane. I told him as much when we had him on the show. Um, and Militza is a very dominant uh, mid laner that has typically played with a lot of priority to himself. Though initially when he came on the scene, he was the guy that was breaking out Scion mid and stuff like this. That was, that was what he famously played uh, against Foggen in their debut. Um, what was the name of that roster again? Click Tech. Uh, when there you go. On Click Tech. In the group that stage, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, that was always famously playing there. He also obviously played Rise and shit like that, but nowadays he's much more known as like a heavy assassin player. He just played with a guy called Razork, who has very heavy mid priority. Um, and he excels at just not necessarily stomping laning phase, but once he gets these significant leads, he dominates in skirmishes and he dominates in team fights, and therefore Schemes is almost perfect for them. Because Schemes was a guy who forced very heavily around neutral objectives in skirmishes like these. And so having having this lineup is, is almost perfect. It's very obvious yeah. what you play around I early mean, and, and it's very obvious how to break it open. I have to hardly agree with this, but uh, I have to say you know, like taking a weak side bot lane is really good in this roster because Kavachar is the player that will demand most of the yeah. times to be played around. And Milika is the type of a player which it's it's the best meta right now for those players yeah. where he will force jungler to go mid, he, they will get 2v2 prior or they will fight 2v2, they will get slide leads and then he will transfer that lead into side lanes, which is su super good with a player like Cabo Chart. So let's say if they like win TV2, he will be non-stop roaming top and he will be non-stop picking champions that can just gank top lane for Cabo Chart. So then that way they will win two lanes while having a weak side bot lane. Yep. They will basically just roll over the game. I think he can just play mid to top, top to mid, just play very heavily around Herald's side of the map now, especially given that like first Drake is no longer like as incredibly strong yeah. as it was on last season, yeah. right? You I mean, he, in about. Giants, he used to play around bot lane all the time. Uh, most of the times, but uh, it doesn't really matter if, if like you can play around top lane as well, right? It's not that hard to learn. I, I would be willing to predict something like that as a red side team. They're gonna be like almost unbeatable, to yeah. be honest. Like I think they're insane. Okay. Any more thoughts, Cabra? No, oh, I I actually really really agree with everything they say about Militia. So it's the one I have uh, more targeted. Right, in terms of an in EU though, like mid lane is not just any position, mate. Like in theory, no. I would still say to this day, I think EU has the best mid laners in the world if you look on average over the entire league. Like yeah. the difference is we can have a guy at eighth position who might be good. Start going to eighth in Korea, mate. I tell you, it drops off like a motherfucker. <laughs> so what is what is Militia, Militia going to do in that regard? Because as I pointed out many, many times, you do not win LEC without a really fucking good mid laner. I think Milice is really good and he's certainly really talented, but I absolutely agree with Freeze. He gets giga camped by yeah. Rasork or he used yeah. to get giga camped. And I'm worried about how this will translate to like, I don't think he's as talented as uh, maybe someone like Nemesis or as hyped up, but definitely I think he's a, a really smart player when it comes to he gets like really smart reads of team fights, and he's usually the yeah. decisive guy that will uh, tilt the game one way or the other uh, at any point in the game that there's a group fight. So I really yeah. like him, and I think he will be a splendid pair pairing for Cabo Chart. But but we'll see if with the amount of junglers that there is in like that can play around mid lane because in Super League it's really rare. There are not that many good mid laners. We'll see if he can hold up. 
This is where I somewhat disagree with Freeze. I think that they're actually going to play heavier towards Cabo Shard and then use priority on Cabo Shard and transfer that towards Militza rather than the other way around. Uh, I know Militza is typically demanded otherwise, but I think Cabo Shard will end up being the dominant voice here. And I think in the current meta, it would be better to play around Cabo Shard first. No, I think so. That, uh, sorry, that's what I meant. I meant Militza yeah. going to Cabo Shard, basically, not right. uh, the way other around. No, but I think what Veteran means is that you think they will play uh, mid jungle into top, and he thinks yeah. they will play top jungle into mid. Top jungle into mid. Ah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. So okay. he's right on yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. how I think it's going to end up playing out. Um, right. But I think the biggest point about the fact that Melitza will typically break open the game on neutral fights after getting severely ahead for due to camping is, is, is the bigger issue. Uh, because Schemes himself has been playing very strong economy uh, as a jungler. Uh, Cabo Shard will be incredibly strong in those fights, and I think you don't necessarily need Militza to be monster ahead at that point. So even if Schemes doesn't camp for him, and Militza just keeps playing really strongly in these fights, because we've seen him play heavily from behind, right? Like the LeBlanc game versus uh, Big in the finals of EU Masters, that was absolutely incredible. Their team was behind, and he was still finding every single opportunity he could. He doesn't need to be ahead to do super well in yeah. these fights um then the fact that schemes will force around neutrals will just be beneficial to him regardless and it will get ahead then i think he's almost perfect for this team uh and i think having a weak bot lane which they will have for this split um doesn't really matter so much in the current meta so yeah. right if we pivot to another team then right if you thought 2019 was the year of flaming misfits what's well, still 2019 so welcome back motherfuckers <laughs> right I already made a video uh, about this veteran in the off season where I pointed out, and it turns out I, I jumped the fucking gun, mate, blew my load a bit too early. I pointed out that Misfits categorically failed on almost every level as an org where they took their super team worth loads of money, did fuck all with it. Then they even like tossed all the coaching staff around. Then they like gradually started throwing their fucking uh, top academy talents to the wolves. And then they threw them all to the wolves at the end. And then they mismatched them still. And at the end they said, actually, you know what? You guys aren't good. And they were like, yeah, you employers. And they were like, get the fuck out of the league. And then they went and just said, right, what's the minimum we can spend to still have humans who play in League of Legends and keep our spot? As far as I can tell, that's the story. I made the last part up myself, right? When we see this lineup veteran, am I hard flaming them here? Like, the difference is with the other teams, I can believe some of these are top prospects. This team really looks like at the end of the... It's like when you go to the, the fucking supermarket at 9... 55 and it closes at 10 and you're like right there's really fun on the fucking shelves left right there's like there's old bread that's like 50% I'll just get that fucking we'll just eat that it's like am I missing something is it are they the gods of scouting or is this a shit lineup it's a shit lineup and uh Ben, if you're watching... They should have kept some of that academy team, come on. I, I, Oh, God, dude, I would have just kept the fucking academy team and replaced jungle support, maybe, and that might be... Sounds it. like they fucked leader as well by making him wait till the last minute and they, then not get oh, any God, fucking look, deals. We'll get into all that, but Ben, okay, if you're right. watching, mate, like, your org chart is massive, and I've just discovered why, and it's because none of the people who are responsible for hiring that abomination of a roster you got last year got fired, you just moved them up, and then added more people. Like... Just start firing these people because it doesn't appear to be a single mistake that they can make that 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 will warrant that. Like they all just get fucking promoted the more mistakes they make, and it's actually insane. This is an organization that is only going to keep making worse and worse decisions the way that they are going. They muddle the decision making process by having this many people, and they keep people who verifiably make horrible decisions for this organization. It's actually incredible to me. The current lineup that they're looking to field is absolutely absurd. So I can. See see why on face value as a redditor you might think well we have razor and Denix, so we have a strong jungle support theoretically so we can build whatever we want around this right well the way razor and Denix played as a strong jungle mid jungle mid jungle uh, support was almost based entirely around Melitza and how heavy yeah. of a priority he got and it wasn't just slightly heavy priority this guy i i watched this guy in fucking semi-finals of eu masters first item sork shoes on elise which is fine if you're going heavy gank, clear one camp until he got to level uh, five, and then he was level five versus level three on the enemy jungler, and then he sits mid for some.
long that he ends up level five for level seven versus the enemy jungler. He just sits there and just takes one. He just takes one scuttle camp the whole fucking time. He just sits there. That's how heavily they played around Melitza. And this team was able to do that because there aren't very many teams on their side of the bracket that were able to abuse how horrible of a strategy it was until they met big. Um, but 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 you can't do that in the LEC. It's not a fidelis way to play the game in the sense that you can't build anything around this. You have to build a very specific set of players around this. Um, and they haven't <coughs> done that. Ronaldo is an almost completely untested element. He isn't actually that high up as a mid laner in solo queue and never has been. He's always been like a master diamond one player as this. There have been brief periods where he's been challenger, but they've always been brief ones. He rolls sort to support, played mostly support for all of last year uh, for Fnatic Rising. He's very untested when it comes to this, and I assume they only grabbed him because Handro is now the head coach there, and they probably need the mid laner last minute. Right. Um, I don't know why they got rid of leader if all they want to replace him with is Ronaldo. Ronaldo's way more. Sounds like they just didn't want to pay a leader. Yeah, Maybe it, this it guy's cheaper. Like yeah, I mean, this guy probably is way cheaper, but but if you think leader has champ pool issues, like this guy, this guy literally has only played two champions in mid lane, like whole of last year, and he's not even really that good on them. Like it's it's really mind blowing to me. Dan Dan is not that good in lane. He's a very good weak side uh, player. So if you had a really strong strong side mid laner, then then it was almost perfect, right? And you had that with leader. I don't understand why you would get rid of him, or at the very least, give him a chance. And then what the fuck is happening with the bot lane here? Like you you got rid of who actually did really fucking well for you last split. I don't know why you've... There's another him. player who could be instead of fucking Destiny. Come on. Yes, there's another player. There's another player. But 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 the big thing of he was they tried to replace him in the middle of last split as well when he was doing really well for them with DOS. Super well, actually. Like. Yeah. He was playing really fucking well for them. Then they replaced with DOS. So one of two things is going to happen in this scenario, right? Either DOS is going to do really well and everyone will just assume Heaver was bad for the team because they don't understand what they're watching and all they see is, oh, they replaced him. It must have been an upgrade, right? They'll just think Heaver was worse. So you'd fuck Heaver or DOS does bad and you have to replace him with Heaver, in which case DOS gets immediately fucked. And you've basically guaranteed DOS never gets any LEC offers again. So the moment you make that decision, you fuck over the careers of one of those two. Then you fire both, by the way. So thank you. Those are two careers you've ruined there. You boot leader after putting him in a team where mid lane was not the problem, by the way, which was Febivan, who I'm also not seeing appearing on any of these rosters. You fucking fired him. You place him with leader. Leader doesn't get a good debut, and the debut is so fucking important. And then you fucking fire leader bef at, at so late in the game that he he can't hope to get another team like most national league teams have signed mid laners at the point where you fucking fired him right so you fuck them over kire comes in shit stomps the first game he plays for you guys then keeps playing decently for the rest of the split and then you fucking remove him immediately i have no fucking idea why like i the, the whole everything makes no sense and then you grab in a fucking Korean ADC who was getting shat on in the LSPL according to every Chinese expert that I've talked to now was getting fucking shafted there before that played in fucking Latin America North when you have Neon on your fucking academy team who was last year one of the best free AD carries that wasn't playing in the LEC you have him sitting on your acad team and then you release him and start this random Korean who isn't an untested rookie Korean he He's tested and he's shit. Like, what the fuck is going on here? Like, I know the situation. I've got, I've got the answers for you. I know those are a lot of rhetorical questions, but here's the answer. Now, this is going to be a boomer reference. None of you are going to know this, but okay. there's a chance someone in the world will know this movie reference, and it's a straight fire reference. Right? Misfits is clearly a Brewster's Millions scenario, which is a movie from the 80s where basically the premise of it, it's actually a, a movie with uh, fucking Richard Pryor, that classic black American comedian who's dead now, sadly. Now, in the premise of the movie, the reason it's a comedy is, he, ha he he finds out that he has some like great 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 uncle or something who's actually like you know a fucking billionaire and that guy brings me in and says like listen I know I know, I know it's crazy you think we're actually related and you know I'm gonna actually I think it's something like you know I'm gonna be dead soon or something. I think it's oh I think he's already dead and it's like the will's been read you know and they have like a, a video that he has to watch and what the guy says is listen I know you don't even know who I am I didn't know who you were but it turns out you're my last living relative and so here are my instructions since I don't know you I don't know if you do any well with my business. And my business is worth loads. So I'm not going to give you all my business and all the billions, but I am going to give you like a like a purse of money. And let's say it's, I can't remember what the amount is, it's millions. Or it's like, let's say it's 10 million. And his logic is this. He goes, I don't want to see you use this well. What you have to do
do is you have to find a way, because you're just a nobody now, to spend and waste all 10 million of this as fast as possible. And if you can spend all 10 million and be broke, absolutely dead broke on this date, you'll have learned enough about like, you know, business in the world that you get my billions. So it's this crazy, like, it's actually a cool premise, you know. So what happened was... Ben Spoon took over Misfits, clearly the same scenario, you know, some super rich guy was like, oh, but the thing is, I need to know that you like learned about the business. So the first year, he just signs loads of players for mega bucks. That's one way to waste a lot of the money. But then he's like, oh, I'm fucking wasting a lot of the money. But these idiots think LEC spots value are going up. It's like, so we've got to tank the value of the spot. So then he goes, now we don't spend any money. We waste all the money anyway. We just get the shittest players ever. Players that don't even make any sense. We mash them all together. Coaching staff, don't hire them. They might fix something. Young, young Buck, who the fuck is Young Buck? Like, get the get that guy back who used to be a support who wasn't even that good when he was a mid laner. When I don't know, whatever, get him in again. And then they do that. And then I think at the end of this year, when he's wasted all the money, he gets the billions. Wait, wait. Can I just ask? <laughs> yeah. Why, why didn't the guy just donate ten million to charity or something? Because this is a cool movie. Like the whole point is, like <laughs> it wasn't real life. You know, it was a movie. It wasn't a documentary uh, veteran. You can't give it all away. You can't give it to to someone in the street as well. True. You have to buy stuff. I think it's like something weird. Yeah, there mm-hmm. you go. But um, I mean, but... I have to say though, I like. I mean, I think Dundan, Razork, and Denik are good though. Uh, I just they don't are. understand uh, the mid lane and the AD because that team. If you would put it with uh, with let's say even forbidden right yeah it would have a lot of potential right you would have a yes. veteran on, on on mid lane you would have a super talented jungler you have a weak side player on top lane uh you have a support that is super vocal and can literally guide every single player in the game how to play the game that would make sense right but, but just... try and tell me that razor condemic wouldn't be perfect with dan dan and leader like that's perfect they, they, they would yeah i mean yeah why are you fire leader? <laughs> like, it makes no fucking sense to me. Holy shit. And the, the, the AD carry thing just blows my mind. Like, they are so lucky AD carry doesn't matter so much right now. Because I, I don't know. Again, you have any on there. You have plenty of AD carries who looked very strong. Even the hell, like, why not just fucking take Deadly if you're going to take the old Giants mm. roster? Like, Deadly performed really well with them already. You know that he can do well with them. Why not take him? Uh, it's, I don't know. The, the whole venture makes no sense to me. Like, they gave up Han Sammer, so maybe they're thinking they should save money. But then if you want to save money, just fire, like, 90% of your organization. Most of them are playing useless fucking roles and the rest of them that are doing the useful roles are doing shit jobs of it like i i don't know this whole organization makes no fucking sense to me this roster is mid to lower tier uh maximum and it's probably, probably the worst team one, in the league this is one on. of the teams we're looking at at being a 10th probably. place team um but i i don't know maybe they end up with like a they can't even get a slight buff from the fact that bot lane is not really worth anything right now because dan dan is not historically a strong laning player mm. he's not good in lane he isn't He's not the kind of player you ever really want to play around. Neon's the kind of player that you really want to fucking play around. I don't think you want to play around this current guy who's down there. So I I don't know. Like this just the whole thing makes no sense to me. At the same time, I hope none of these players go in thinking that Misfits has their best interests at heart. Because these guys have ruined an unfathomable amount of careers in the last two years. And it's actually insane to me. These guys have to be fucking psychopaths to cycle through players the way that they do. It's actually insane. I love how they just decided to dip in and ruin Doss's career while they were at it as well. Like I was not very high in for on a penny and for a pound. <laughs> it, it just makes no sense to me. Like, holy shit, these guys are fucking psychopaths. Like I don't know. It blows my mind somewhat. There you are. Right. Okay, we'll pivot. There's only two teams left. So what we'll do is... Oh, actually, I think both of them have interest, but we'll do the less interesting one first. So SK Gaming, as far as I know, all they changed was support and uh, jungle. Obviously, they didn't choose the jungle one. Self-made went off to... Fanatic, at which point Loco naively looked up at me with his big poppy dog eyes that I've never seen a fucking LEC get. Just kidding. He will watch his like four seasons or something. And he looked up at me and said like, don't you think SK should have tried to keep self-made? It's like, yeah, and whoever the first fucking boyfriend of like fucking Kate Moss should have kept her, you dumb cunt. What are you talking about? Like, <laughs> what choice do they have? Like, they don't have any fucking, they don't have any money. They have no good, they don't have any pedigree. And he wants to leave. Like, what do you, what, what more do you want? Like, anyway. So they've lost him because Self Made went to Fnatic, obviously. So they've replaced him with Trick, who like pff, somehow keeps stealing checks. So he can't get away with it anymore. Whatever. That like fucking mean meme from Breaking Bad years ago. And then at support, this guy I don't know at all, actually. They brought in a player called Limit, is the rumor, right? So, is that the right is that the right support oh, Wait, they bought in limit. That was yeah, says it on the rumor said, page. Said, Am I wrong? Yeah, it said uh, it says uh, limit. Yeah. 
I think it's Linus That's right. interesting. Okay. Okay. It was on a German team with Gilius, apparently. Yep. Well, Limit was on a German team with Bean, who I think, by the way, is the next big AD carry that we'll be talking about. Well, don't tell story. fucking Misfits. <laughs> Exactly. There you go. Approach, you run. You just exactly. fucking run for the hill. There'll be other yeah. opportunities, Bean. All right. Don't. But Bean's really it. young right now. He literally only just came of age. Um, but he he he's improved more than like any other AD carry on the ladder has. This okay. is his first year being in Challenger, but he mm. might may as well have like always been there. He was a grandmaster player before, but he improved so much this year. It's actually yeah, insane. Like, don't, don't oh, by the way. Quiet. I should just quickly mention it again in case people don't watch the show that often. Like, that means since they kept the other players, they retained Sakura, who they brought up in the yep. summer. They kept Gen Axe, who they brought in right at the end, actually, of the summer, but he was he was pretty good in the few games he played. And then they kept Crown Shot, who veterans actually a fan of thinks is a good player. But then again, he doesn't have dreams anymore. So what what's the take on what everyone jump on this? What's the take on this team? I think I want to see Crown Shot play with Limit, because Limit's actually really good in lane as well. Yeah, Limit's uh, pretty good. And- yeah, Limit Limit has a perks buff, so Limit's one of the few players that people in the Reddit comments will have actually already heard of. Uh, perks Does he do all with them on stream or something? Oh, right, okay. Well, they're both from the same country. Well, um, we all know well, that's a fucking <laughs> perfect reason why like, fucking hell, get me out. Get me out. <laughs> um, I don't think Limit's on the level of an upcoming talent like Lavrov, uh, for example, in the mm. support world, but he's a very interesting one, and uh, Perks basically just got him into the LEC, so I hope he's fucking appreciative of that. But if SK uh, gets shit stomped by G2, we know why. Um, I'm actually really interested to see him play with Crownshot. Crownshot has pretty much never played of a strong laning support. Dreams is as good as it got, but Dreams' good aspects were out of lane. Um, and during that whole Nemesis self made Mad Lions period, uh, there was one split where basically it was dictated if Crownshot won lane or not, whether they would win the game or not. Crownshot became like incredibly good for that team. Um, and he became the best of the 80 carries in the period where Neon was uh, also in the running. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see him play of Limit. I'm glad that they chose that because given that they grabbed Trick, I thought that they were just going to like start importing another support or something, especially when mm. I heard Steelback wasn't going there. Um, but I think Limit's almost perfect for them. Uh, I just I worry about Trick because Selfmade did so much over the map. Uh, Trick has pretty much been an AFK farm to six jungler yeah. and then last split he became an AFK farm to six with the occasional gank towards mid lane. Uh, right? But the Limit, problem is, so. mate, this is the problem you're always going to have with Trick. First of all, you will never convince someone who isn't an expert that a player who won a championship was bad. Like, they'll always believe it. You might be one of the G2 chat. like, shut the fuck up. Look who he's playing with. Secondly, sadly, the nature of players, hence why you can't always trust their opinion, is if someone comes from their country or someone's their friend or someone there's an ex-teammate, they're never going to flame them. So, for example, all everyone will have heard in interviews last summer was, like, Perks bigging him up. And everyone who played with him who was a former person bigging yeah. him up. Yeah. regardless of what he did you know so you never get a true sense of who the player is unfortunately when they like that yeah but it's the yeah. same thing with limit right now so I mean, like i'm saying limit is good but temper expectations just because perks was sucking his dick right okay. like it's just temper expectations yeah, it's like. like everyone is afraid to say something bad about everyone because no one wants to burn bridges you know yeah i get, I get it if you're an active player by the way, even though veteran taught me that, fuck that. Like, even though veteran wasn't really using that particular like phrasing in like a mean way, that's also another thing. By the way, all those fans out there, because we had the earlier section where we were like talking about forgiving a lot, and I was saying he was going to do super well, right? Every fan out there who thinks this is like a clever take to go like, Haha, wow, he really sucks forgiving's dick. Like you are aware that's essentially no different than when a little kid in the playground goes, well, if you love him so much, why don't you marry him? That's your <laughs> level of fucking discourse. Like when I say something, you reply with something a fucking child in the playground would say so just say not a good comeback didn't age well did it young fucking zoomers oof oof big yikes you didn't make it did you now maybe dip in your, <laughs> a fucking thesaurus and find a few more words you absolute twats anyway so cabra you've got to have some thoughts on the sk lineup uh i don't know i actually thought that self-made carried super hard the performances yeah. of this team i think crown shot is good but maybe more so in the later part of the game yeah. i actually liked his team fighting a lot but maybe in lane there were some mistakes here and there that didn't give the best performance sacre was completely disappeared for the summer split i don't think that sk roster had any idea on how to make him work properly i'm pretty excited for to see him this year maybe in a yep. more relaxed environment instead of thrown in mid-season 
and Genax, I didn't get to see uh, a lot of, but I, I think he will actually be pretty decent. Trick is serviceable, but I worry that he didn't know where top lane was last year. Maybe this will change when upset is not on your team and he can actually enable Sacre. I think it's a team to watch and to be excited for if you want to see the, like the pretty good players of the future, but I struggle to find a, a super talent or mm -hmm. someone that is a must yeah. follow here. I don't know. I feel like they will not be very good. Uh, I feel like they'll be top seven, maybe, you know, like as a team. I, I just have this feeling that they will not do well. Indeed, there were two massive improvements that were made to rosters last year. One was the addition of Jessica and Mystiques, which suddenly turns that shitty XL lineup in spring into a lineup that ended up beating Fnatic G2 and all this shit, right? Um, and then the second massive one that I think we've all forgotten about is when SK finally dropped the living dead weight that is Pyrian and grabs Gen X. And then when they did that, they suddenly went from being a 10 place team to a team that should yeah, have they... gone to uh, playoffs and they yeah, probably could have gone further. Gen yeah, X felt like self -made was Yeah, but it just felt like self was enforcing a, a lot of the place, you know, like Maybe I don't know how Trick is, but if Trick is gonna be a passive player, then that team is not gonna work at all. Yeah, team, yeah. which is yeah, why yeah. I thought Steelback would be really, really good for it. Um, like, for me, jungle is basically a rookie and a Korean. It's a bit weird now to take to have like a. I, I don't think this that strong of a card, honestly. I think yeah. Genax, you always get a bit of a buff when you first sure. play in leg, but yeah. then when people figure you out a bit, I don't yeah. know if he will be I that mean, impressive. That's true. Actually, and I, yeah, I, felt no, like, I, I felt like Cruncher was very passive as well. Like he was the type of AD carry that needs his team to do something to carry in team fights because his team fights are amazing. But he will not do anything himself, right? So if the whole team is going to be passive, I just feel like that team is going to be really bad if they will uh, not have a playmaker. And that's why I agree I that Steelback would be really good. Like I think would Sucker be plays really aggressively in lane, but you won't do anything with it. Yeah, and he he yeah. plays better as a split pusher, and he's not really very strong in team fights. And yeah, like I I just remember being really high on this roster on this and Loco, but now I remember that that was because I was modeling this roster as one that Steelback joined, and Steelback made up for the issues that right. we're talking about. But he's not there. Limit is there, and while Limit's pretty good in lane, and that helps with one aspect that Crown Shot's been missing for a while. Um, he he doesn't add what the team needs added, so it's it's dysfunctional. So yeah. So you're saying, ha ha, he will be the ha ha limiting oh, factor. Ha, ha. Hey. Like there we go. I did it in the style that like a fucking shit stream chat would enjoy, even though this isn't a stream show because hey, yeah. I actually have fucking dignity. You know, I just beg people. And, I actually and I also, think if you, you want know. to do one of those jokes, you should just go straight for it because it's a bit of an okay, okay boomer moment, no? Like this uh, classical news that everyone. No, 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 the problem here is you're not actually understanding that I'm explicitly making it clear that it's shit because, I mean, you're Spanish, so, like, you don't actually understand entertainment. Like, you think a big fat guy going, oh, my God, is, like, the most amazing shit to ever happen. Like, like to you, that's, like, fucking David Attenborough speaking. Like, oh, my God, this is so sick. I just thought it was a big guy just saying people's names really slowly. Like, I'd put it on fucking 0.25 speed. And I don't give a fuck if this guy's like the patron saint of your country in League of Legends. I said it. Like, I thought that was just okay. It was overhyped. <laughs> I, I mean, can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> I don't give a fuck. Get, on, get in that Reddit this. thread, boys. Get in that Reddit thread. <laughs> I've taken uh, worse flame. I think it was okay, know, but, but I was like... Yeah, but I, I had one thing to, to come back to, but okay. to interrupt interrupt me it gets a little bit awkward so maybe come on then going come on no just do it just do it we'll, like, we'll we'll forgive you for the awkwardness so come on try and hit me with it come on no i was going to say that maybe you're used to your english fans eating it up since your country has shit food but you know uh, i i got lost uh no, I've said I, this I before. It, here's the thing. First of all, don't come from a country that eats rice and start talking shit on food. Like, that is literally <laughs> the most basic food in the fucking world. Like, that's like animals eat that. So here's the other thing. And by the way, your food just looks like someone sicked up a bunch of fish into the rice. Secondly, like someone who ate porridge and a bad fish and then was sick in the morning. So that's your best food. Secondly, I'll just say what two things, okay? There are two meals you will never fuck with ever in your life unless you're a Korean and you have Korean barbecue. One, what? What is the most important meal of the day? Breakfast. Full English breakfast shits on anything mm. you have. Eat a croissant, you can't. Have some fucking yogurt, don't mm. give a fuck. Full English breakfast, body bag, game over. Second meal, and you've never had it because you've never been to England to the parts that do this. So it, is, <laughs> it is a roast dinner with Yorkshire puddings and gravy and properly roasted lamb and the mint sauce. That is... 
God tier. And, that, and now I'm not saying all the rest is good. I'm not even saying England's the best. I'm just saying, listen, even though it's just banter, it's actually, I, that's one of those banters that doesn't work that well because the real problem is everyone foreign thinks fish and chips is like fucking British food. That is literally like fast food. It's mad. It'd be like me saying like the only food America has is hamburgers. Like that's pretty unreasonable. So anyway, whatever. Wow. It was all right banter. It was decent. It was a decent throwback, you know. I get your angle though. Like that, that's the reason why that guy would be... No, no, no. It's, the way not, right because it's not my main language, so I'm shit at bantering. But I'm no, no, it's all right, man. It, you know, it, you did I, all right. You did all right. I just want to say, I've been in LA for a month and a half and I'm still pretty convinced that this country's main food is just hamburgers and stuff. Like, that is what American food appears to be. You go into any of, like, like the sorry, diners and stuff, refer, and it's burgers you, everywhere. Like, English cooking shows are always taking recipes from other countries and completely making absolute embarrassments of themselves, so... Maybe this is why the the culture is that you guys eat like shit. Uh, everyone that has been there says it. So all I'm gonna say is that yeah, yeah, all the League of Legends players who've been to Leicester and stayed in a fucking two star no, hotel I mean, and ate shit. Yeah, fucking like hell. Friends. I don't just talk to people on Twitter. Listen, mate, all I'll say is this: count up the number of Michelin star restaurants in Spain. Count up the number in England. Let's see. Let's see oh, who wins that one. The number of Tell them. You to a Michelin restaurant that your politics are eating well doesn't mean anything. What are my politics? Are you? Oh, he means politicians, right? You mean rich people. I don't know if you're aware, I'm rich yeah. as fuck. I eat whatever I need. So uh, there's another thing. If you have to literally rely on the fact that, like, but my people ate it thousands of years, so you're eating what a fucking pee on it like, uh, uh, after he came out from the field. I just eat the world's best food from around the world. You know why? I had a motherfucking empire that ran this shit, so they're all my food. So your country's all right. Didn't have Spain. Every other country, they're mine. So I'll uh, take everything for... Yeah, it's no, it's all. an art, and if no one can perform it, okay. you actually get the sensation that it's good, but it's actually shit. It's a bit of what right. with your okay. friends, and everyone in the competence being absolutely bad, but if you have, <laughs> have a rival... Maybe yeah, it's all like that. Yeah. I'll just say this. Final topic would just be this. I can see why you think cooking's an art. I think it's making food to eat. That's because you guys think saying someone's name really slowly is an art. Game over. That's it. That fucking lawyered. Well, we have to do the last team now. We can't go on forever with this. It's not even anything to do with League of Legends. <laughs> right, so anyway, the last team is actually one that's pretty cool. I think it's an interesting one to top up, which is Rogue basically kept most of the players everyone liked. They kept Finn. They kept Inspired. They kept Larson. They kept Vander. And all they changed was what was the one P Polish position nobody gave a fuck. Woo Light, of course. We were like, is out, and they brought in Hans Armour from Misfits. So basically, the rogue that everyone loved in the playoffs last year didn't make worlds, obviously, but you know, fair enough. They're a fair new lineup. Upgraded AD carry, basically. So, what, mm. do, what do you think of this lineup? Where are people coming down on this one? I mean, <coughs> honestly, like, right. literally, the only reason that Schalke won versus Rogue in playoffs was because of Vulai, an upset difference. Like, the, the bot lane difference was so huge. That Schalke managed to win, even though Rogue was the better team, sort of, which uh, was insane. And it's just like for me, Rogue is a team that I'm looking to be top three in, in yeah. spring. Like straight up, like they will. By the way, I feel like they'll be top three. Just I as a very quick aside, I just want to say because I just because it's so ridiculous. You know how ridiculous it is that we had all this amazing conversation, all these spicy hot takes, loads of insight, and now 400 comments are just going to be about food and when the British food is good, <laughs> and about the fact that I insulted the guy who says everyone's name really slowly. Like, and sadly, this is like this is the real curse. Like he was saying before, that's the curse of content creation. You can make a great episode, but yeah. it's guys always and, the stupid guys shit. In the comments, if your European country wanted to argue about us about food then you should have won the seven years war okay that's that's it. that's and it. by the way i'll just say one other thing i'm not going to hear a word from a german about food nah <laughs> it's not it happening mate you your best food is basically you figured out how chicken nuggets are made and made a giant one with pork inside you are shit game over <laughs> so any, anyway that's right i put okay. fucking germany where it needs to go you have to drink beer to enjoy your food enough said <laughs> okay so i disagree with what um We've, we also have them all fucked on drinks, by the way. Whiskey beats, cognac, all that shit. Um, but I want to go on what Free said about the only reason why yes. Shock 1 was because of the bot lane difference. Uh, I actually disagree with that. I think the only reason Shock 1 was actually because Trick was playing around mid lane pretty heavily. And as a result, Shulker had numbers advantage on whatever side of the map that they wanted to fight on. Whereas the problem with Rogue is that Rogue assumed mid priority from Larson based upon matchup, but Inspired never actually gets priority in mid and then roams to other side. So what you were seeing, even in the first game, 
where Rogue won, every single uh, skirmish that happened, Schalke had numbers advantage. Every single, even in the first game. Schalke were just losing skirmishes in the first game with numbers advantage. They were losing a 4v3 in their favor and shit like this. Um, but the problem is that Rogue never went through mid and then made a play. So the moment they met Schalke, who went through mid and made a play, they were at a numbers disadvantage. And then they got countered by Fnatic and G2 because Fnatic and G2 went mid with jungle and support while Schalke mm -hmm. were only going mid with jungle. So there was three man on mid instead. So they could never get the mid priority. So Fnatic and G2 could always make the play. That was fundamentally why they lost. This roster change doesn't necessarily change that whatsoever. It just means that the phenomenal level of talent that was already on Rogue that was allowing them to win fights with numbers disadvantaged <coughs> and with a bot lane difference, well, it's obviously worse than upset, but they were still winning all of these skirmishes happening around bot side of the map. Um, e even with all of that, it's just gotten even better now. I think Hans Sam is almost perfect for that team. Yeah. I think he's the kind of guy that allows Vander to take over the map like he was. I think we're going to see a lot more opportunities for Vander to impact mid lane and maybe we'll see a change in play style from Inspired and Banda towards this fanatic G2 Freeman mid style that they have been uh, <coughs> pioneering. Um, I, I think it allows these next level advantages to take over. However, it doesn't automatically give them that. Um, but I, I, I think Vanda's smart enough to, to add all this himself, and Larson is definitely smart enough. Like They actually have very smart players on their team. Mm -hmm. Um Oh yeah, that's why I would disagree with you, and that's why I would disagree on that. But I still think it's a massive upgrade, and this is a team that should be thinking about worlds as minimum. They should be competing with Splice for it, and Fnatic maybe. Fnatic can't guaranteed. What do you think, Cabra? Yeah, I I agree on the world's competition. I think it's a super talented roster. I'm really hyped to watch both Fing and Larsen play a full year with no interruptions in LEC. I actually think Bander has been flying under the radar of fans. I think he was playing a really solid support, but you know, since he was playing a team that <coughs> was not as talented, he wasn't as hyped. But sure. yeah, overall, I don't really have much of an extra take. I, oh, what about this question? Right, if this team's going to be this good, is Larson like MVP level player? Oh, yeah, he is, he's one of those kinds of players for sure. Um, but I think that he may be outshone by Finn. Uh, in terms of pure laning prowess, I think Finn's champion pool and Finn's play uh, style in lane. Is oh, by the way, I, I don't know if you talked about but, this on the fucking face check episode or whatever, but for people who, because obviously this was what people kept saying in 2019, for the fans who were like, why didn't this team reunite Vander and forgive him? Because actually that doesn't make sense in terms of role balance. Like if you've got Finn and Larson, what's the point in having an AD carry like that? Uh, yeah, but also but we saw Finn play... Like, a level of weak side that most didn't have to play in in the league. Do you want him bit. to be a carry though? Uh, I yeah, but if we had forgiven on there, uh, Finn demonstrated that he can still hard carry okay. on Aatrox even with zero priority. So I think Finn's the kind of player that you, I mean, this this guy was a Kled one trick man. Like this 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 guy can play those kinds of carry style champions in lane with no priority that have utility, okay. right? Uh, and and he can make that work really well. I w I wouldn't have minded putting forgiven on that roster. However, I think. All of the personality issues you may describe with Forgiven, all of the uh, issues maybe to do with support that exists with Forgiven, they don't exist with Hans Sammer. You ultimately don't need Forgiven to bring this team forward, right? You don't need him. It's probably the bigger point. So why not focus on maximizing Vander, maximizing the rest of your players? Why not? In which case, Hans Sammer is perfect, you know? I think this was also maybe a bit of a, a hype roster when we were thinking it with forgiving in last year, but yeah. I think both Larsen and Fing have proved themselves to be much more reliable than yeah. I was at least anticipating in Lek. So yeah, I think the role balance point meta making is really good. The key I, thing with this team for anyone who hasn't watched LEC is literally not a single player in this team is bad. In fact, they're yeah. all actually good to yeah. promising or very yeah. good. Yeah, that's a very accurate representation of this team the closest rookie team we're going to get to that this year is going to be the mad lions team like they if you, if you want a comparison for them compare them to last year rogue like there there isn't a bad player on there except for will i on rogue last time but 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 kazi is not like bad okay so. right but being as there are in there's in theory one team left that we didn't talk about because it's g2 and they didn't change their lineup is there anything to be said about g2 like what what angle can you take on that 
typically speaking, teams that do not change after going so far in international competition end up getting abused when they come back because everybody has spent the entire off-season studying to become them. So everyone yep. understands what's good about them now. So it will be very interesting to see if G2 make progress, if they did sit out this off-season, if they did take a break, take holidays like they were doing beforehand, they will be caught up to now and they have I to. Mean, they have to understand that. They didn't play yet, right, in the preseason, but I have to say that I'm not worried about G2 because G2, all those players in G2 are the players that play literally the most solo queue okay. with scrims. <coughs> like, you know, like Caps was sitting at like 80 games of solo queue or like 100 games of solo queue sometimes a week with scrims. So uh, other players were like 60, 50, you know, like all the other... The the average in LAC was like 50 games a week of solo queue, and then you have cups uh, and perks pushing each other and playing 100 games of uh, of solo queue a week, you know, during like scrimming as well. So I don't, I'm not very worried about G2 not uh, being able to adapt or or pick up something new again and show everyone that they are the best yeah. team. They're, I've they're, got a they take on this, by the way, yeah, which is that. Okay, so everyone's worried, like you're saying, about the hangover of coming back from Worlds. And then it, I think it's also like some of it's psychological. Like, you know, you go from like almost being at the absolute top to like, right, you have to start at the step one and build all the way back up again. And like, that's actually a problem. Obviously, like focusing at the beginning of a first split that doesn't technically get your Worlds and decide any of that shit. So I'll say this. I actually think what can offset that, though, is... The way G2 ran over the league last year, this year, is not going to happen next year. Like, there are tons of lineups now compared to last year that if they at all fuck around, even if they play well, they could still lose to. There's a bunch of lineups they can get yeah. wins off them. So even if they win the league, if they can still be dominant, then they're an even better team than maybe we even thought. But I would imagine this would be a way closer one where they're going to be like... I don't, I don't know what the records will be if it's like a close one. But, I'm, you know, I'm, they're not going to be winning like fucking 14 games this split. I don't think that's a, a reasonable expectation. If you should look at how much quality there is in the league now and how many teams got potential like playoff stairs. This is, however, whereas we've talked about, if, with the exception of Rogue, really, we've talked about how a lot of teams have either personality clashes or someone doesn't talk where they probably should. There might be a black hole here, like all this kind of stuff. That still doesn't exist on G2. This is still one of the most phenomenally well put together rosters we've ever, we've ever seen, to be honest, uh, in terms of as a five-man unit, as uh, in terms of decisiveness, <laughs> there, there shouldn't be any issue. So they just need to plug new strategies in and play them out. But as a five-man unit, this is still one of the best constructive bosses you've ever seen. So. I mean, if they will enjoy the game, they'll be the best. I can say as much. Like If every, if, if every single player enjoys the League of Legends and is not burned out, they will be the best. I'm a bit worried about the founding philosophy of G2, or at least what I understood it to be from the players, which was the idea that they can win worlds after getting 3 0 in a, such a dominant fashion. I don't know how that will, will affect their perspectives, but maybe, like, I wouldn't be surprised if some of these players, maybe they are not as confident in the idea and they do not put, put as much effort because of it. Okay. Mm. I wouldn't say I, so. I think I think I think like from from what I got from the G2 players, they all kind of knew that they underestimated uh, FPX. It, it was so obvious from their tweets uh, on Twitter, from the interactions and stuff. I'm pretty sure literally everyone feels like they underestimated uh, FPX from the players, uh, even even coach, and that might actually fuel them to do even better and just prepare more uh, actually rather than not okay, trying. So how exactly does this happen that you reach world finals against uh, a champion in, in their region? And like, uh, uh, please, I, I'm not trying to flame. I'm just trying to understand the point of view of, the, of a player. How could you play disrespectfully? I mean, aren't you fully focused in the game once it, it starts all the time? I mean, the problem with this thing is, I don't know if, if you guys are just missing this backstory, but the backstory that I heard like from Grabs when I down with some local was that they'd played FPX in scrims and they used to just get fucking tooled and apparently everyone in the playoffs just got tooled by FPX. So the problem is, the theory is like they didn't go into the final blind. It was the exact opposite. They went in thinking of all the shit that had gone on in scrims. And so as a result, they uh, thought mad shit like, right, you have to get a pike going in mid lane to get the fucking bot lane going. Like, like they uh, were, they, that's the level they were already on, you know. They weren't mm. actually coming in. Like, I think basically... As a result, the tweets were just them doing the banter as usual. Like, sadly, it sounds as though they actually came in thinking, like, how the fuck do we win these games? Which is probably the most depressing story of all. Like, I'd rather your story, if anything, you know. Yeah. 
I wonder if maybe... all the same, they are still the super team. Come on, like look how good these players are. <laughs> yeah, that's Because I've always said the crazy thing about this team and why I think they should keep this lineup for as long as they can until they literally get bad as players is these the, the the it's not just like how good the players are at their roles, but you could literally as each meta comes just pivot which players carry. It's actually I've never seen a team that really could have done that. Like if if the entire game is played upon bot lane, cool, just do that. If the entire game is based on soul lanes, yeah, we can do that as well. Oh, the jungler needs to be dominant in this one, yeah, that's a good one. Oh, the jungler has to be a little bit more of a tank. Jankos can do it. Like what can't they play? In theory, every meta. So it's all on them. It's all on them and their psychological. That's why actually we've all taken this angle. You know, it's just like psychological take or do they themselves actually like want to change it up or will they play disrespectful? Like there's nothing really in the game to say they should lose, right? They should still be the fucking best. Yeah. We're pretty much yeah, I, I guess, I guess the issue is that like, that like what Cav is identifying appears to be an issue of scouting, right? Yeah. So yeah. You would think this would be fixed by adding people and stuff, but I would then worry about ruining the atmosphere that you have in there. If you add people there, right? Like it seems mm. like they have an almost like perfect, set up there and you don't really want to mess with any of that to add something in so maybe it's maybe like grabs or duffman has to like step up in this particular aspect because it it was obvious to a lot of analysts how you should play against fpx and that they had issues with that seems they, like they didn't do any of it <laughs> it just seems mind-blowing to yeah i just it, it worries me somewhat because like this just means I, I i guess grabs doesn't step up because grabs his opinion on certain players seem to be way off so unless he's doing it for pr purposes like maybe he's not the right person for to it. be fair maybe i will throw in like to be fair i have to throw this in they yeah. did only lose one series all year long like they yeah, never they... tasted failure they never actually had anyone make them for going like, oh fuck we have to totally refix everything like <laughs> they just won every time so that would absolutely set you up to potentially lose at the absolute worst time especially like because, I mean, it's really easy for the people who do this and seem to get everyone telling them this, right? Everyone was telling them that, nah, 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 this version of SKT is really dominant. Oh, no, Korea's back. They're all insane. Sure. Korea does really well in the group stages, you know, even though group stage is fucking best of ones, but we still give it insane credence. Uh, and then and then they, they, they don't just beat both. They beat both 3-1. It's not even five-game mm. series. It's, it's a larger stomp than it ever was. MSI was not a stomp. MSI was very close, went down to the wire. These did not go down to the fucking wire free one both teams both yep. teams that everyone was saying was insane both teams everyone was saying were world contenders from the region everyone was trying to tell them got better no they just stomped them and then they go into the finals against fucking fpx so i could see maybe then why they wouldn't be so worried like cab was saying but it it wasn't that was it it was it was that they didn't understand how to beat fpx i'll give you another piece of info because it also just reminded me that's the other yeah. thing that's crazy like i don't know whether this is grabs retconning everything and trying to like spin it backwards that it, like he basically made it sound like as soon as they got to worlds and they like lost to griffs in etc like literally nothing was good in the team from that point on like he says they also were losing all the scrims to damn one and that they literally thought going against damn one they were going to lose then they won and then against skt okay they beat skt before so they thought they could win they won that one so he actually makes it sound as though like it's actually a miracle they made the final which I... by the way again doesn't really say much about the psychology of the team does it like why are you arriving at worlds and be like ah fuck we're probably gonna lose like i just did play back that five minutes ago about the super team like what the fuck are you talking about i can i can <coughs> i can see why it would be better to make your team think about it that way though because if they think that okay we just need to come in with a better plan next time they won't try anywhere near as hard to improve whereas you want them to keep improving and you want them to okay. keep feeling like they have to skt did this by replacing players every year they're, they always replace top jungle they always then threaten support they sometimes threaten the mid lane because if you threaten their roles this is how you force those players to keep getting better and better, <coughs> and better and better so if grabs comes in and says yeah nah destroying korea was easy we always knew we could do it blah 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 and his team adopts that mentality they're just not going to try as hard right and then they will be outdone they will be outdone so i can see why he would want to make it seem as if the world was always against them and it was a miracle and it was luck because that means that there is a level g2 still need to get towards right and if everyone goes in with that mindset they'll improve so i could see why he would say that there i don't see why he would say that broxa was uh was really really fucking good or something <laughs> Maybe just bought him a beer or something sometime. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we'll just leave it on that note. This video was kindly supported by Alexander Rao, Blunt Smoking Anus Destroyer, Dane Cuskley, Dean Tanglas, Ho Chi Mao, J Dobbs, Nate Dio Double G, Peter the Feeder, Tobias Bernasconi, and a special thanks goes out to Jerky's Minion and Mohammed Al Abdul Razak. 
Do you want to suggest a topic or a guest for my content? Maybe you'd like to ask me a question in my monthly Patreon AMA. Would you like teasers on upcoming content that I'm doing? Maybe you want to take part in a discussion directly with me. Well, if so, then put your money where your mouth is and join the Skluminati today at the Patreon link in the description below.